Daros la bienvenida. Welcome all of you to the start of this cycle of deep journalism. We are going to carry out in Media Lab over the next week. We start this weekend with the seminar. We will have a couple of cycles uh, with presentations and conversations between today. We start from 5 to 8, maybe we will be a bit longer. And the second session will be tomorrow from noon to 3 p.m. And from those who don't know it, next week, from on Monday and Tuesday, we will have some workshops with Adam Harvey. And Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday with Christo Buschek. Welcome to, for all of you. This uh, seminar of deep journalism is a part of one of the transversal workshops carried out by Media Lab within the cycle of sentient media, which are these labs, uh, for those who don't know it, Libs labs are quarterly cycles with different activities from Media Lab. We try to highlight some of our investigation ideas, the eight lines we started with in January this year. In this first case, we're dealing with sentient media, with which we're dealing in a very wide manner because it can cover a huge amount of concepts. But in a quick way, we're dealing with the ability of systems of different systems, both technological systems, but we also have to consider what technology what technology means to make visible dynamics that would be would be invisible at first. In this context, we believe that journalism, that somehow is devoted to this to make stories visible, otherwise these stories wouldn't be visible; they would remain hidden. It was one of the disciplines we wanted to start with, or deal with, in this laboratory. You will see that we do it from um, anti-disciplinar or interdisciplinar approach. For those who follow us for a long time, you know that Media Lab, we try to, in Media Lab, we try to collect all those projects that don't have room in any other more disciplined context and are these points between disciplines that merge uh, innovation, dynamics, and practices that have no room in other more orthodox centers like universities or other academic centers. For this seminar, I won't talk too much. We have uh, Marta Pirano, who has been the commissioner of working with us in Media Lab to organize this cycle of conferences and the workshop which we will uh, conduct next week. As you know, Marta is a journalist, writer. She's the author of uh, The Enemy Knows the System, which is a, a bestseller about capitalism in platforms. And soon she will publish a new book. I don't know if we can say the title. Not yet. But we are on the verge of publishing a new book, which is very interesting too. Marta was also and uh, was working with the Diario.es, which is a, a journal from Spain, and many other platforms in Spain and the on, and abroad. So thank you, Marta, for working with us over these months, working this seminar. And the floor is yours, so you can introduce what we are going to see today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, for for the presentation, for the introduction. Thank you for coming a uh, day which is not uh, actually the magnificent weather that I sold to my guests today. Everyone says, come to Madrid, uh, it's sunny, but now it's it's raining everywhere. Well, this is not the, the good part, but I hope that the rest is fine. So the idea of this seminar is to prove that journalism is not in crisis, even if media are in crisis, although it has changed a long time ago. Uh, I've been a journalist for a long time, and I can say that most of the times we don't do this Watergate uh, journalism with uh, with deep uh, deep throat people in garage in in a dark universe parallel in Washington. But it's not either the journalism we did uh, years ago or at least not the, the Enron journalism, which is the journalism uh, in which we have to look for hidden data from dark sources and unbury the truth from many data, from a huge amount of data, which require a lot of time, a lot of effort, 
and a lot of devotion and knowledge of from journalists who must be reading and highlighting things. Deep journalism is a concept that we have stolen from the concept of, of deep time that is used to talk about from geological times that escape absolutely to our understanding because they are too large, they are too long. We can stand conceptually 3,000 million years because uh, we can understand that, but we cannot perceive it, we cannot feel it. So we take that concept to talk about a journalism that is facing not only big databases from filtrations, from leaks, like the papers of Panama, but also the data that are generated continuously by the the, the extraction machine, digital platforms, to the ability we have now to interrogate individuals implied in a story, or what we call the four W's, who, when, why, and what. But we can interrogate time, spaces, objects over time. We can interrogate scenarios where there are packages of data that are suspended and can, can visualize through specific technologies. In general, deep journalism is a place, is an environment in which information, because of its volume or because of its status or because of incontinence, let's say, or for, or for being endless, escapes the, the capacity of the journalist and the human capacity, so, and sometimes it requires specific tools to be managed. Therefore, right now, we are seeing like in, in spaces where the access has been closed in terms of events like journalism, like, it's hap like what's happening in Ukraine and Russia for the same reason, but, be, but in different manners. Right now, there are like at least five commercial satellites looking at those spaces and producing maps that uh, until five years ago were only in possession of governments. They were capacities that only military people have had at the moment, but right now they are available for everyone who wants or knows how to use it. And well, this space has been opened not only for journalists and journals, of course, but also to institutions of all sorts and people from among them hackers and artists who have been interested in the world of information and who are assisting foundations, journalists to unravel the truth and because of communication issues uh, and also regarding to human rights and today we have two, two, two of those people who are going to introduce two projects that have earned many awards, that have uh, assisted in the recovery of many information for information analysis. Uh, right now, I don't remember who was first, I think it was Ellen. We will have Adam Harvey first. Among its many jobs, an interesting project, he has been working on an archive called the Serial, Syrian Archive, where a tool that he has learned, which is called V-Frame, has been used to find basically evidences of war crimes in all audiovisual files that have been generated over that period, a material that is absolutely endless, to which is very complicated to uh, accessing for instance, through a, a browser. And then we'll have Christo Buschek, who among his, uh, his many deeds among hackers and software, one of the latest one has been assisting in the research of, of the management strategy of Uyghur in China, through which China China's government has been collecting and capturing uh, people in these detention camps, this in, in these so-called uh, education camps, educational camps, one of the journalists who has been investigating this issue have been kicked out of China. So he has generated a tool so we can access to uh, criminal activities from, the, from a humanitarian point of view, but outside the space only using technology. So with nothing else to say, after the speech, we'll spend some time here to talk about the project. So I give the floor to Adam. Thank you for coming. So, would you like to use this one? Okay. Yeah. Or prefer this? No, this was great. Okay. Thank you. So it's okay if we, it's okay if we take the... 
Yeah, okay. Thank you, Marta. And thanks, Eduardo, for the introduction. Um, it is nice to be in Madrid. Even if the weather is not spectacular, it's still better than Berlin. And I'm going to talk about my project, V-Frame, that Marta introduced. It's a computer vision project, and I'm a computer vision software developer. But I was an artist before, to some degree. Depends how you think of it. And did my artwork began looking at computer vision critically in 2010. It's probably the first computer vision exploit, hacking face detection, uh, breaking it by reverse engineering open source profiles that were used to detect faces, and then converting that into a fashion design. I'm pretty sure that it made it to um, fairly interesting places based on conversations I've had at hacker conferences because at the time face detection was just one algorithm, which meant if you broke the algorithm, you broke everything and it scaled. But things have changed a lot since 2010 and we're now in the era of deep neural networks and actively trained computer vision algorithms, which means if you have enough data, you can encode almost anything into a computer vision algorithm. This opens a lot of doors, uh, creates a, a lot of different problems or issues, challenges, and also opportunities. So as I've uh, moved through in the other three examples or other computer vision projects that I've worked on, one is defeating thermal imaging, which is used in uh, military drones to ron launch uh, heat tracking projectiles, uh, turn that also into a fashion project, and then a, another uh, instance of camouflage using it as a decoy strategy to provide sort of the perfect face and then to camouflage yourself in that. And then I began working with other artists to develop computer vision for their projects, doing things like face recognition, emotion analysis, um, object tracking, and uh, you know, by 2017, I built a custom face recognition system for Ai Weiwei's exhibition in New York at the Armory and came out of this realizing that at this point, I'm a computer vision developer and I could make basically whatever I wanted to because a lot of the tools now are open source. And that got me thinking, well, as a computer vision developer, what would I make? I no longer wanted to be an artist from the outside looking in and really changed my practice to think about as a, uh, someone with agency of a software developer, what is it that I would want to do? Instead of continuously poking Big Brother in the eye or critiquing things from the outside, I didn't necessarily want to be on the inside. I just wanted to create what I thought was a better way of looking at the world. And the interesting thing to me about computer vision is that it encodes a certain way of looking at the world. In this example, it's encoding a cluster munition, and it forces you to look at the cluster munition in the video. This was the first demo, uh, first example that I developed with a group called Syrian Archive, who's now grown into a larger organization called Mnemonic, and I thought, this is pretty easy in 2017. All I need is a few examples, and then I'll have a functional computer vision project. And then really, really hit a wall with the project because there is just not enough data to train algorithms for very specific, rare objects that appear in conflict zones. So the problem is that you need to find a rare object but in order to find that rare object, you need a lot of that object to train an algorithm. And that meant progress was very slow, data was too scarce, and the project was borderline not tenable in the way that I imagined it. So in order to find the data, uh, then I built a data search tool that would take millions of frames, I think it was close to, in the hundreds of millions of images, frames of videos, 
and it works like Google Search, except you can run it offline on your own laptop or workstation. And if you want to find every example of a missile launcher, then you can probably do that interactively. The problem uh, was still the original problem that there just weren't enough examples of the things that I wanted to detect. And eventually found a few dozen of each object and then with the way that it works to build computer vision these days is you find examples of what it is that you want to detect and then you put them into an annotation platform. This one is called See That. It's an open source tool. And then you draw boxes around everything. And when you draw boxes around it, you're encoding that thing into the algorithm once it's trained. But I still had the same problem. I don't have enough data. Um, so it's kind of a, a make or break moment where either keep pushing forward or try to tackle smaller problems like deduplication or uh, just smaller uh, computer vision problems. And then in 2000, like for the last about three years, sort of working on this idea of, well, what if I just made the data? Instead of looking for it somewhere else, uh, as an artist, I can create things. So what if I created the data? The fake it till you make it strategy. Starting with a few examples of what it is that I'm looking for, worked with a 3D modeler to create a 3D model of this and then would apply a photorealistic texture to it. And you can see model is quite realistic, but it really looks like a 3D model. It doesn't look like the images that I showed in the beginning. So there's, there's still quite a bit of work to do in taking this very clean 3D model. And the goal is not to make photorealistic training data because uh, it's too real. Um, often the images are compressed and they're copied over from one platform to another. They're taken in a conflict zone, which means that there's a lot of motion blur on the images. So they're anything but a straight, normal, clean photo coming from your camera. These are other examples of uh, incendiary mun munitions, PTAB 1M, and that are delivered from cargo munitions that look like this the RBK-500, and another object called the BLU-63. It's another cluster munition. And this is uh, kind of where the project for synthetic data started with a set of about six objects, and then used that to render these uh, scenes that would try to mimic the way that objects were appearing in the videos that I looked at, called the target domain. And you can, in the 3D, do almost anything, spin it around, change the lighting, randomize everything. And it was working well enough in 2019 to get a good sense for the capabilities. Uh, this is the output of a cluster munition detector trained only on synthetic data. There were still a lot of challenges. If you look at the output, you can see well, they're often damaged or covered in dirt, uh, color changes, and some of the objects aren't detected because they're overexposed. The fins are bent, so it's a very extreme appearance of the object. Damaged munitions sometimes were missed because, uh, as I mentioned, the fins are folded over or caked with dirt. Uh, in this example, it's too overexposed on the top, and that was missed. In this example, it was too occluded or partially buried, and that one was missed. So, you know, looking at it from the computer vision standpoint, um, it's not a perfect tool because the object doesn't always appear as itself. It's mangled, damaged, um, could be broken in, into multiple pieces. And this makes it quite difficult to detect, you know, what the question is, what is the object anymore? Because uh, often the object changes. It's almost a dynamic object in a conflict zone. But you can see that overall it works uh, quite well. So this was encouraging uh, 2019 
uh, 20, getting some good results, and then tried another technique, which is uh, 3D printing the data. So I would take, would create the 3D model and put it in a um, SLI resin printer, and then paint that and turn it into a realistic version, if you can see here. This is a staged scene with the 3D printed munitions. So I would do all of these <laughs> fairly eccentric things like stage a um, you know, scene with 3D printed objects and then move around it as if it were being documented because uh, I'm trying to overcome this um, make or break issue of not having enough data to train algorithms. And I was willing to do whatever, whatever weird um, art experiments were necessary to get that data. And it eventually was able to get realistic um, or to match the target domain enough with 3D rendering that the results uh, really went up and noticeably to the point where it was working even well on the damaged pieces. So here's an example of a 3D rendered AO25 RT cluster munition found in Syria. And you can see the difference in this example between on the left drawing the boxes on it, which is incredibly slow, monotonous, and error prone work. It also requires that you have the data, which again is the major problem in developing custom computer vision tools for monitoring conflict zones. And just in the time you're able to draw boxes on one object, you can render five, maybe even more frames on a, on a simple scene. So here we can see uh, another example of annotating and what that looks like. And for you know, more specific numbers in the last few years, I was only able to find about 30 videos, uh, of which some only have one, two, or three frames. So in the end, there are about a few hundred different images. And the problem is that you need about 10,000 diverse images to train a good object detector. So there's a, there's a huge shortage between uh, a few hundred and 10,000. And this is where the synthetic data strategy can become a real game changer. And these are more examples of what that rendering looks like. And I'll, I'll now step through the process of how each part of a scene is uh, kind of modeled and then randomized. Because uh, 3D tends to be too realistic, and you want to convert that to uh, the target domain that you're working with. The first thing is to randomize the dirt and the metal qualities, the roughness and the metallic factor of it, and to randomize the color of dirt. And another thing is to kind of randomly distort it so it's not such a rigid object, kind of looks a little bit wiggly in this photo, in this video. And then to change the zoom factor, which not only changes the size, but it can also change the you know, camera lens warp of how an object appears. And that's uh, particularly helpful because many of the scenes are documented with uh, smartphone cameras, which, have, which do not have a full frame uh, CMOS sensor. So it's slightly uh, warped because of the wide angle 35 millimeter style lens. Then to change and randomize lighting conditions from a sunny day to an overcast day. Uh, even change the color temperature of the lighting. Basically change everything you can in the scene as much as possible. No two images should look alike. Uh, so that the object is you know, fully modeled in every possible way that it could appear in reality. And that also means obscuring the object and putting things in front of it because objects are often occluded in the real world. So putting rocks in front of it, putting different types of grass in front of it, and you know, in production, all of those factors are combined, and then you end up with a scene that looks like this. This one is pretty clean. It's for demonstration purposes, but I think you get the idea. And that would yield a 
large collection of images. Here's a, a preview. Again, these are all look the same because they have the same uh, background. And you'd want to make sure that there's a good diversity. Now there's, there's another problem, <laughs> a lot of problems in computer vision and making something work when you don't have enough data. Because how do you test it? Uh, you can't really test it on the synthetic data because that is cheating. You need some kind of real world data that's disjoint from the training data set. And in order to create that data set, would use the 3D printed munition. And then again, stage these scenes and photograph it, trying to mimic the target domain of how objects were appearing in conflict zones by adding dirt, uh, putting rocks around it, the occlusions. And I would use that as the benchmark data set. So I would use that to evaluate how well the object detector worked that was trained on the synthetic data. I hope you're still with me. And then um, here's the output of that. So this is just a pretty clean example uh, in an early uh, checkpoint. You can kind of see how well it works and some of the points that it breaks. And yeah, then I'll move to the latest one. So this is the second half of 2021. This is kind of the latest research and the latest development in the project is developing the detector for an RBK-250, which is a cargo munition, meaning it delivers sub-munitions, cluster munitions. And again, it starts with a similar scene, and then it randomizes the conditions for the environment and the dirt textures appearing on it. The 3D program outputs a color-coded pixel mask, and then can use that to um, OK, so then here's an example of it working on real footage. And this is just showing the latest version of the model. So what, what is important and works well with this model is that it fails when it should. For example, if only half of this RBK is visible um, and it looks like a barrel, it shouldn't be an RBK 250. You have to um, make a decision at what point is the object no longer the object and also encode that breakage into the object detector. And this is another version, I mean, another example of it working on a very clean uh, appearing RBK-250. You can see not only does it detect it, but the box is very accurate in the uh, edges of it. So it really, you can tell, understands the boundaries of that object. And I'll going to move um, quickly through these. These are the, the real world examples from an output trial on about 100,000 videos. And they are, I think, really good. The detections show that it's able to find it when the object is you know, appearing dark, angled, uh, partially stuck in the ground, arms appearing in front of it. You can zoom in a little bit and see that it does, it's quite robust to the occlusions. And in another example, it also uh, works quite well, even if the object has motion blur, which is quite common for conflict zone videos, because people are possibly running or moving quickly away from it. And also when there are a lot of shadows over the object, uh, it still works really well. So this was a, kind of a big moment and big breakthrough for the project is being able to prove and run it and see it working on real data that you can go from a 3D model to a object detector working in the real world with good accuracy. What's also important is to calibrate the model and train it in a way that it doesn't flag false positives, which are objects that look like the thing 
you're trying to detect. Um, and this helps uh, eventually reduce the time of a, an analyst or someone wor working on reviewing all of the videos that come out of it. And I have a, kind of a list of things that I've learned, which is, feels like it's quite long. I found that there is so much excitement for AI in the general sense that all of my excitement has been for a very narrow application. And I found myself really moving towards thinking about moving away from this idea of a you know, general uh, AI capabilities and just thinking very, very specifically about I want an AI that can detect this very specific thing appearing in Syria and I don't care and I don't need it to do anything else. It's very specific. And thinking about it in that way has helped stop wasting time on a lot of the other exciting areas of AI and just think practically about it, how it can be applied to the problem uh, that, uh, as Marta mentioned, uh, journalists and researchers are faced with is sometimes not that the data doesn't exist uh, for journalists, but that there's too much and you're drowning in it and there's no way to find the needle in the haystack effectively. The other things that I learned is that synthetic data really is a game changer. And it's not just me. It's becoming uh, m much more common in many large-scale applications. In fact, Tesla is using it to kind of gap fill scenarios where they don't have enough data obtained from the uh, self-driving cars or partially self-driving. And so they 3D model the scenes and then uh, kind of mix that in with the real data. So the, the opportunities for the synthetic data in the context of conflict zone monitoring are absolutely tremendous. Uh, 3D model data is definitely the future of computer vision. And what's great is that it is also accurate because I think you can control it. It's not like you're taking all of these images from the internet and hoping that they work. You're designing it and reviewing and every image is uh, intentional. It actually brings AI back to the beginning of computer vision when um, engineers would do what's called feature engineering. And what the great thing about AI is that you don't have to do feature engineering because you put a bunch of hundreds of thousands or millions of images into an algorithm and it will automatically do that for you. The problem is that it ingests a lot of bias and problematic ways and often noise. So with 3D data, you can really gain control over that. Um, it doesn't always work because there are some objects that are too generic. For example, a metal tube that has fallen off of a rocket might just be too generic to detect unless you're willing to have a lot of false positives. It tends to work best when objects are very unique like the RBK250 and the AO25RT that I showed. Um, <clears throat> the, real, the I think big challenge now is figuring out how to integrate the capabilities of this kind of computer vision with the output and the uh, research or investigations. So there definitely needs to be more development in kind of uh, middleware or bridge software to negotiate how that data is handled. And you know, sometimes people think maybe this is um, could be misguided because shouldn't it be the researcher that makes the final decision? And that's exactly the goal of this project is not to um, overtake any decision-making process. It's merely to reduce the noise and work much like many other algorithms do to take um, something that's too verbose and to compress it into a manageable smaller size. And if you can cl clearly define the objectives, for example, that you want to find an RBK250 and you know what it looks like, then the rewards, I think, are huge. <clears throat> so as an example, uh, I think the time is okay. Um, let's say you have 1,000 videos and you want to know how many contain a specific object, a cluster munition. How long would that take you on your own? You know, watching 1,000 videos 
from a conflict zone. It's not something that you really want to sit through. So can computer vision solve that puzzle? Computer vision can solve that puzzle. And the way that it works is by compressing all of those videos, by taking 1,000 videos and compressing that data set into the one or two videos, and then just put those in a folder. And then you can do your job as a journalist or as a researcher. So in, in more practical terms, which I'm not sure if all of you are interested in, but as the developer of the project, these are the things that excite me. So how quickly can you do 1,000 videos? Um, on a high-end desktop workstation in probably less than one hour, assuming the average video length, uh, which commonly is for documentation and conf conflict zones, about one and a half minutes. That's 24 frames per second, 90 frames per video, 2,100. 60 frames per video. OK, I won't read all the numbers, but that works out to about 1,000 videos in one hour. You can do six uh, minutes per 100, one hour per 1,000, 10 hours, about half day for 10,000 videos, and 100,000 videos in less than a week, and 1 million videos. That would start taking a long time, over a month probably less than two months. Again, these are for a high-end workstation. So there is a sweet spot for the way this kind of technology works. But you could also parallelize it if you have the resources to do that. And then you don't really have any bottlenecks. But let's say that you're working offline. You want to keep your videos secure. Kind of a sweet spot for the way the technology works that I'm developing is if you have 10 videos, you just look at them yourself. If you have 100 videos, um, if you have a team, then you can probably still do it yourself. But once you get into 1,000, then you're hit with, um, you start drowning in the data. And that's where computer vision can really, I think, improve the capabilities of, of researchers and journalists. For the more developer-oriented group, you know, the actual output that you can get is, uh, just raw text, and it tells you very simple things, which is nice. How many frames in this video contained an RBK 250? So you could think of it as a kind of visual grep, uh, if you know this term. You can grep the video and filter it for anything that contains uh, the object that you're looking for and filter out everything that doesn't. But there's a lot of snake oil in AI. And that's why I don't think it's enough to merely tell you about it. There's also a demo online where you can test it. And the demo is trained only on the synthetic data. And it's completely disjoint from any real image of the RBK 250 in this example. And that's the video. At the end, you can see that you can now run these tools in your browser with some limitations, but you can process probably 50 to 100 images at a time. And then you can uh, download or export that. And this is nice because I realize not everyone wants to manage a Python environment on their local computer to run it. So they can get structured data out that way. All of this has become a lot more urgent in the last about two weeks with Ukraine. And these kind of tools for monitoring online um, you know, sources, OSINT sources of data, are becoming really urgently needed. And as I showed you before, one of the objects uh, I think was called the RBK 500. And uh, yeah, about a week ago, the first example of an RBK 500 was documented in Ukraine. These are, um, as a researcher from Bellingcat points out, extremely nasty uh, objects that can drop hundreds of submunitions. And now that these objects are appearing, I think it would be helpful to automatically monitor for them. 
I mean, this not only reduces the workload, but it also prevents um, traumatic exposure to watching too many of these videos online. So this is one of the models that I've already created because it was appearing in Syria. And you know, something very concerning that's happening is a lot of the scenes uh, from Syria are now replaying in Ukraine. And I think what to many of us might have felt like very distant conflict before has become a lot closer. And so these tools uh, to help monitor and locate and understand the conflict are also becoming um, more urgently needed. Thank you um, for listening and also to the funding partners and research partners for the project. I just want to bring it back to the beginning with the final slide and emphasize that this is a technical project, but I mean, I, I'm not sure if it matters if it's um, an art project or an evolution or an art project in any way. But the, what does matter, I think, about the project is in doing, spending a lot of time with computer vision now, you realize that so much of the world is mediated through computers and software and algorithms, and that the way that we're seeing the world um, is through computers. And so if we can change the way that computers see the world, then I think we can begin to change the way that we see the world. It's the last slide, sorry. <laughs> All right. So, um, quite an audience. Thanks so much for coming, and I want to thank a lot to Matadero Media Lab and to Marta and Eduardo. And I really want to tell you, like, come tomorrow as well, because I think tomorrow is going to be a great session with Susan and Alberto. I think it's going to be very interesting. So, I want to talk generally a little bit, like, take a step back and talk about, like, uh, data from a high level view and what it means as an investigative tool. All right, can you hear me? And um, I want to start with a, like, a little story. And the story starts in 1991 when George H. Bush, President of the United States, goes to Japan for a state visit. And during the state dinner, somewhere between the second and the third course, he starts to shake a little bit and pretty quickly vomits on the lap of the Japanese Prime Minister and collapses. Um, this... Um, the imagery that you can see like, invokes a lot of like, uh, memories, like uh, the older generation will see the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the newer, the younger generation will uh, think of Kevin Costner probably. But um, what happened back then is that these images were immediately transmitted back to the United States and people saw the images and immediately thought, oh, the president, he died. And on CNN, the, the uh, announce on CNN was stopped mid-sentence where he was just about to announce that the President of the United States died. All he had was actually a stomach flu and he was fine the day after and it was all good. But um, the interesting thing about this is that like uh, back then, like while TV was not a new thing, what was new is like this 24-7 TV news cycle that like everywhere where you were, there was a camera present and the images were transmitted immediately back to like the uh, uh, TV station and broadcasted immediately. And back then, we, people didn't understand it yet. Uh, people didn't know how to deal with it. Didn't, people didn't know how to verify this uh, imagery that came in. So enough of this. So I think we are like in a similar situation when we talk about data, because data is not a new thing. Like people use data for like many, many years. Like people use data in political science since the 70s. The social sciences uses data since 1900 around. Um, but they normally speak of data in terms of statistics. 
they, they use data, they have simple data sets, and they run like a function of the data and come with a result and say like, uh, I think that the next chancellor will be this person based on just like a trajectory that I see. But the thing when we talk about data nowadays, we actually like, we are like at the new stage. We are something that we call like data driven. And I think that's an important uh, distinction to make. We are like reaching like a new step. And I think this is what I want to talk about. Like what is the difference when we talk about data and data driven and what it means for investigation nowadays. Um, another term that I also sometimes use is computational methods because it's a very broad field. There's like a lot of things that uh, uh, play a role here. But I, I, I will use the word data driven because it's so much easier to pronounce and computational methods is really long and everything. But in case you hear me say this, like uh, it can be also this in my opinion. So um, the problem with data investigation is it's a relatively new field and um, we have troubles defining it. Um, the, for the type of work that I'm doing, there is no real job title. Like, I, I cannot open a newspaper and look for jobs and like, oh, I'm working as X, Y, Z, and I'm looking for a job like this. So I've been called many different things, like I'm a programmer, I'm a researcher, I'm an investigator, I'm a data journalist, I'm a journalist, like I'm a lot of different things. There is not really like a category to place it in. And one of the reasons is because like we haven't defined the field yet. We're in the process of actually defining what data investigation means. And there's a lot of like different variations, like the work that Adam Harvey does is like one aspect of it. Bellingcat does other things, like similar like Adam Harvey, but I think the field is much, much bigger. Um, and I think what is important for this is like the different things have to come together and this also makes a difference between like data and data driven. I think like uh, when we want to work data driven, we need technology, uh, we need designers, we need uh, storytellers and we need investigators. Like they all have to come together in order to form this new field that, uh, that we call data driven investigation. And there's like a... Um, there's like a high level overview and I will go into it a little bit uh, uh, deeper later on. But there's also like a little bit of like a process behind most of this data driven uh, um, uh, work that we're doing. And they, they are not always the same, but they're roughly like you can put them on this thing. And the first one is like we have to preserve and get the data. Then we have to like explore it and find the data and see what's in there and understand the data. Then we have to verify it because like data um, by itself has no statement data is always dependent on the context it was collected in and the data and the context in which it is observed. And then the last one is like we actually have to produce a narrative out of it because in the end like why we are doing all this, like why we put so much effort into this is to tell these stories and data allows us to tell very, very exciting stories. Um, so my personal little bit, so that was a long introduction. So uh, I'm, my trade, like I'm a programmer, like I, I program for like 15 years maybe now, maybe longer. Um, and until recently, I've never seen myself as a journalist or anything like this. So these are all labels that were given to me and I am those because people call me this, I guess. Um, but uh, what I'm doing actually like on a day-to-day -day basis is like I just develop tools and methods. I sit in front of a computer, I program, I build a tool and I give it to somebody else so they can do their work. Uh, I'm, I'm not doing the investigations myself actually, like, but I work with people who do the investigations. And, and, and I see my role as like being someone who can enable certain types of activities. Um, Stuff that I did in the past work, like, and that's the one project I want to talk about this time. It's uh, when we exposed uh, the, the, the dimension of the detention of like Uyghur uh, people in Xinjiang, and that's a project I'm going to talk about later. But in the past, like, stuff uh, work that I did is like document the war in Syria. So I was also like, uh, uh, my tools basically built a collection of the Syrian archive and collected like millions and millions of videos, Facebook messages tweets, imagery, like all different kind of things. Um, and I also, for example, like other work that I did was like to track the trade of conflict resources. That's like uh, diamonds, gold, silver, like uh, coming out of like uh, Congo. We did this by like tracking like um, online trading databases where we tried to like follow these steps, these different databases and see how resources leave a certain area and then arrive like uh, in the Western world, like in London at the stock exchange and stuff like this. 
Um, and also like a very old project that it is like we tried to like uh, show the extent of like uh, algorithmic decision making in local UK authorities. So how much do local councils and uh, politicians rely on algorithmic decision making and like uh, basically relinquish control of like what policy means over to algorithms without being able to influence the outcomes of this. Um, and primarily I work with human rights defenders and journalists, but in the past I also worked with artists in academia, but that's a whole different can of worms, um, we can talk about it later. So this is the project I want to talk about, it's called Built to Last, and it's um, a series of articles uh, that were published on BuzzFeed News. Uh, what we try to achieve here is like, uh, uh, show the extent to which like this incarceration, uh, incarceration of uh, the minority of Uyghur people in China in the province of Xinjiang, how, how big it actually is. Um, just a little bit background. So when we talk about Xinjiang, it's a, a territory um, uh, in China and it's incredibly huge. So the size of Xinjiang is three times the size of uh, Spain. So I'm, I was born in Austria, it's 20 times the size of Austria. It's, it's incredibly big, basically. It's just a pure, sheer territory. Um, it has around a population of 25 million, and of those 25 million, 45% are from like the uh, uh, minority of the Uyghur people. So the, they are not a minority in Xinjiang, they are a majority there, but they are a minority in China. The rest are, of the population are Han Chinese for the second biggest part, very closely uh, following up to the Uyghur people, and then there's Kazakhs, Uzbeks, um, and I guess various others. Um, so this article series uh, was a collaboration with a journalist called Megaraja Gopalan. She works for BuzzFeed News um, and Alison Killing, who is an architect, um, and the three of us worked on this uh, series of articles. And what came out of it was um, uh, five to six articles, and in these articles we combined um, the uh, testimony of witnesses who actually were incarcerated in, uh, in one of these detention centers and the experiences people had. And we also try to basically prove how systemic um, the issue is, uh, like really to show like how big is it. Um, back then, when we started this research, um, we knew something was happening. In the West, we had roughly an idea of like around 20 of those locations. Um, but uh, there was a lot of speculation, like uh, the speculation went, uh, there's a thousand camps, the speculation was there's only 20, like we really didn't know and like really goal of this was like, okay, how can we do this? How can we find out like uh, what is actually really happening there? And the backstory for this uh, series of articles, um, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting one. It started with Mega, who actually used to live in Beijing. Uh, she was the China correspondent for BuzzFeed News. And she was living in Beijing and she heard about like, um, the existence of these camps. And she actually drove there. She took a taxi and drove to one of these locations. That was still, I think, 2015, maybe 14. I'm not sure on the years, but it's been a while. And she, she took photos and she published an article about it. And, what followed is that she basically lost her visa and she had to leave China uh, and she couldn't go back anymore and do her work there. So the problem that she faced was like, so how can you research something without being present? And this is like this classical idea of like data investigation can help you with this dilemma. How can you find a truth? How can you find something out without actually like physically wit uh, witnessing it? So in 2017, uh, Megan and Allison met like at the, uh, data investigation um, uh, event um, and they were, they were discussing the situation, so how can we do this? And Alison as an architect and uh, uh, with a background in geospatial analysis, of course immediately thought like, wow, we look at satellite imagery, I mean it's obvious, no? But so, as I said, like it's, it's, not, it's obvious but it's not so easy because like the territory is very, very big and to look through satellite imagery of like a territory that's three times the size of Spain, it will like, like you're busy for a few years, like at least, like um, I would say, we haven't tried it. Um, so this is where we started. So how can we basically start to find something out from nothing? Like uh, this is our first step. And in computer science, you have like um, a thing that is called divide and conquer. So in, in computer science, it has a very specific meaning that includes recursion and mathematics, but like uh, it still applies also to this situation. The idea is like you have a really, really huge problem and how can you solve it? And the best way to solve it is make the problem smaller. 
and when the problem is smaller, then actually maybe you are able to solve it. And this is the, the whole idea. Like uh, I think 80% of computer science works on this premise. You have one huge problem, just make it smaller so that you can actually solve it. And um, this is also what we try to do here. So how can we make the, the problem uh, smaller? So our problem is like we have a huge territory and if you want to look at all satellite imagery of this territory, we would be busy for years. So how can we basically say like we can do it in one year? Let's say that's our goal. We want to look at satellite imagery in one year. Um, so we applied a little trick and this is something that Alison figured out. Uh, she was looking on Baidu Maps, which is like a Chinese version of um, Google Maps. And the Chinese internet is very interesting. Here in the West, we have this idea that there's like one internet and it's one uh, network. But actually, in reality, there's multiple uh, internet. So there's the one in the West, and there's one internet in, in, in China. It's a very specific thing. And the interesting thing about it is they all have their own services. Like for everything that you can find in the West normally, you can also find something in the Chinese internet. And one of them is uh, Baidu Maps, which is basically similar to Google Maps. And uh, Another aspect of this Chinese internet is that like on the one hand there's always Chinese services but uh, the second aspect of it that is interesting is like it's heavily censored. Content is very strongly moderated and like any service that wants to operate within the Chinese internet has to fulfill these censorship requirements that come from the state. So as well Baidu maps and so there's like a huge amount of censorship that is happening on the mapping uh, material more than in the West and um, the way that they censor it that like everything that is not allowed to be shown on the map, they draw a white rectangle over. Um, so th this is a funny thing, like, uh, uh, and by looking at the, the, the implementation also, like I was able to also see like how actually this censorship is uh, uh, implemented. And that's a very funny story. I will not talk about it now, but like I find it super interesting of like how censorship is implemented. But um, what this meant is that like, uh, can we basically, check or like uh, test the, the camps that we already knew about and see does the censorship happen on Baidu maps. And we did like a manual verification. We tried it on six of those locations and on five of those locations this censorship took place. So every, everywhere where we looked on these five locations and where we knew there was a, a detention uh, center or internment camp, Baidu map was uh, censoring. And this is how it looks like. So if you overlap like a uh, Baidu map, and now the satellite imagery, you can see basically how this uh, looks like. So we thought, um, great, so how, how, how can we use this? Because like now we didn't solve the problem, we just moved the problem to a different area. Like instead of like having to spend years looking at satellite imagery, we have to spend years looking on Baidu maps. Um, so that's not a solution, but it's an indicator. Like, and the idea is like, if we can automate this process and we can get like, the three uh, types of tiles that like Baidu Maps gives you. So it's either like a satellite tile or there's like a watermark tile. That's a, a second type. It's a little bit like weird to see, but it's beige, brownish beige, or it's like a, a mask and it's white and I drew like a, a black rectangle around it so that you can actually see it on the white background. But this is like what we got out from Baidu Maps when we looked at it and the idea is like, how can we like, uh, go through the whole territory of Jingjiang in an automated fashion and detect which of these tiles are located where and then register the geolocation. And in, again, like uh, this is like the type of work that I'm doing. It's like a technique that is called scraping. Uh, so I think by now like a lot of people heard of this term and everybody has like a weird definition of what it means and there's different types of scraping, but overall, you can say like scraping is a technique where you try to extract information from a different program, not like a location, a program, and then put it into a format that you can use again. And we have to rely in data investigation, scraping is the, the alpha and the omega. Like basically, like uh, this is like most of my time, most of my day, I deal with scraping, or I did in the past. Um, scraping is something that we have to do constantly because there's so much information out there, but it's all at different locations, in different formats. Very often they don't want you to have it, so if you have to circumvent your way in to get the data. And this is like a big uh, part of my job. It's just like to scrape this data and get it from like one location down to my location in the format that I can use it. And that's what we did. So uh, I wrote a computer program to actually scrape Baidu maps in an automated fashion. And you can imagine this really like this. It's a program that opens up a browser like a human would do goes to Baidu maps, like a human would do, and then just like slowly drags the map from left to right, or from right to left. 
again and again and again. And when it reaches the end of the province of uh, Xinjiang, it just basically goes like one line down and just goes back again and just like slowly goes through like the whole province of Xinjiang. Um, this was, again, like it was an automated way and it was much faster than uh, um, a human could do. But it was still uh, uh, slow because like uh, one of the things that when you do scraping from a source where they don't want you to scrape data is like it's like a little bit of an arms race. So they, they block you if they detect you, but you try to circumvent it again and again. And one technique that uh, I apply often is like I try to pretend a human. So you have to introduce some random uh, behavior. So you drag it two times to the left. Then you stop a minute, then you drag it one time to the right, then three times to the left. It's like, it's like a weird game, but like you randomize this, you automate this, you just like keep it going and you just try to make it like not too fast so they don't detect what's happening. And uh, this program uh, was successful. It ran for like uh, one and a half months on 25 servers in parallel. And it, that was the time that it needed to scrape this amount of data. And what we got out was like over 50 million uh, tiles. So like the same as Google Maps, when you have like this like map, um, while the earth is curved and, and maps are not straight actually, so there's a way that you basically straighten it up and you surf a map by like uh, uh, delivering like uh, rectangles of 256 times 256 pixels and then you just like slide them in a grid. And um, so each of these tiles is like, uh, that's the atomic unit of how like these maps uh, operate. And um, of these 50 millions, over 50 millions, uh, 5 millions were still masked, censored. They had this white um, uh, uh, overlay. So that was still too much for like, us to look at, right? So we still had to make the problem smaller. So a second thing, like this is just like, a, if you think about it, like, so what do you need if you want to operate like an internment camp? Well, you need the camp, I guess, that's the first thing. But the second thing is you also have to like, uh, deliver like, uh, food. You have, like uh, prison guards have to be able to arrive and leave again and go home. You have to bring the prisoners there. So you need infrastructure basically. So that's what we did. So on this like uh, 5 million sensor tiles, we overlaid data that we had about infrastructure in Xinjiang. So infrastructure, that's like roads or urban areas, um, uh, train tracks, uh, like everything that basically would allow somebody to like uh, bring stuff and get stuff away again. And, and with this, we could like, again, reduce the amount of sensor ties that might be interesting uh, to us. And it was still a lot, it was a few hundred thousands, but it was better and we thought like, well, we can start with this. Let's see how far we get. And this is like now a, an amount that is manageable. So through this process that took like a few months, we managed like, to solve the problem from we don't know how to start down to 50 million tiles, down to a few hundred thousand tiles, and we thought like now we can manage the process. So this is where we ended up. So we started with nothing, and now we started with just like a bunch of like uh, squares to look at, um, uh, mapping tiles. So the next uh, step that we had to do is like something that we call verification. And this is, I think, the most um, essential aspect of data investigation, actually. And while I said like in the past I used to do like mainly scraping, I feel like now with the jobs or the work that I'm doing, actually like I'm shifting over to like more and more into the verification area because I think it's such an essential um, uh, area. So when we talk about verification, again, the field is not defined, so there is no formal definition of what verification means in this field, but basically I would say it's like somebody is looking at data, annotates the data and makes a judgment call and puts it through a due process. Is this data valid? Can I use it? And does it tell me what I believe it tells me? Because again, as I said, like data is not neutral. Like uh, data always has an agenda. It always comes out of like a power relationship, and it's also always like uh, observed and like uh, looked at in this like uh, same um, uh, uh, power relationship. So. To, to, dam or to soften this uh, situation, we use verification as a method to uh, be able to deal with it. So, as I said, like verification is exposing data to a due process. You can really think of it like, like in this like uh, law uh, court dramas that we watched when we were uh, younger, of like where you have like uh, the forensic evidence and you really it has to like uh, stand scrutiny and it has to be tested. So, verification can have a similar um, uh, uh, feel. 
Um, but I believe that verification at the end, it's, it's a very creative process and it's a human process. Like in the end, machines cannot verify data for us, only humans can verify and judge actually what it is that we're looking at and placing it into a context. And I think this is a very important uh, thing that I always want to stress out that like it is so important to like keep the human like in charge of the whole process. It's not machines doing this stuff of work, it's like us humans doing this work. Um, and so I think like we can augment these processes with machines, but we cannot replace humans with machines. That's like just like not a thing. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I have never seen it work at least. Um, and in the end, verification, what it mostly is, it's like, it's, it's like a human machine interface problem. When we say like, okay, I have a few hundred thousand tiles, so how do you imagine what a few hundred thousand tiles is? If I print out this data, I probably would fill like three trucks just with like pieces of A4 paper. It's an incredible amount of data to look at if you would really like, if you would turn it physical. So like, how can you manage this? And this is like the challenge and that's why you need like these different disciplines of like, uh, because you have to approach this problem from an aesthetic side, from like a, a process side, from like a technological side. And that's why like data investigation is this culmination of different fields uh, coming together and, and working together. So this is how, um, in this case, the verification UI worked. Uh, so I'm not a designer, clearly, but uh, it is a very functional thing. And it was driven by the needs of the researcher in this case. Uh, whenever the researcher needed something, that's the moment when, when I added a, a functionality. So I, as a programmer, I will not decide what the researcher needs. A researcher basically has to drive the process, and I can support this process. But you can see a few things here. So, um, in the middle, very dominant, you see like the actual map. So um, the, the map is, uh, or you can see the location, the location represented in three different types of maps. So you have Google Maps, OpenStreetMaps, and Wikimapia, which was sometimes interesting because sometimes people annotate locations of saying this is a school, or this is a mosque, or this is like a hospital. And in parallel, on the second monitor, there was like Google Earth running, which actually provided a lot of the satellite imagery. And then we had like another process where we could get like satellite imagery from um, a commercial provider called Planet. Um, and then each of these uh, locations also had a specific meaning, a category. So we place a, um, uh, a location into a category. Like we say, like, what is it that we're looking at? Uh, like we're still in the process of looking at it. Uh, we think it's something, so we move it further in the process. We decided in the process, no, it's nothing, so we move it out of the process. And then we like, uh, in like several iterations, we try to like get closer and closer to um, a judgment call about what it is that we're looking at. And this like process of like moving things through a process, this is what I call like a, a due process of verification. You start somewhere where you say like, I don't know what it is, it's nothing. And then like slowly you have to basically through a methodology like come to a conclusion of like what it is that you're actually looking at. Um, so to decide um, if something goes into a different category or not is like uh, what you can see at the bottom, which is uh, like a sort of verification matrix. It's like the annotations you're making to a piece of data that give you like a confidence of uh, that you can make a judgment call about what it is that you see. So in this case, uh, and this is very domain specific, it depends on the research what kind of annotations you're actually really interested in. But um, at the bottom, you can see like what is interesting for like our domain. Like we are looking for like an internment camp. So what makes up a prison camp? Do, do I see guard towers? Yes or no? If I can see something, then I say yes, and then like I get closer to like uh, understanding what I see on this picture. Do I see uh, barracks? Do I see um, an external complex outside? Do I see like uh, um, uh, fences, walls, like this kind of thing? And like uh, this is something that you have to develop while you're doing the investigation to understand what it is that you're looking for. And like by like adding these kind of sources and like cross-referencing maybe with satellite imagery and stuff like this, you get closer to an idea of like what it is that you're looking at. But when you start looking at this, you don't know yet. You can assume, but that would be very bad uh, research generally. Like uh, that's independent if you look at data or not. So here are some examples of what this looks like from above. Like because we always looked at this um, data with like a, a, an eagle eye. So you can see like uh, this is uh, the camp in Kashka, and you can see like this is like uh, consists of three different complexes. So. Yeah. 
people connected online. And oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry. So um, just to repeat, like, uh, so you can like detect or recognize like certain elements that make up a prison camp, like the fences, like the barracks, like the uh, guard towers. Um, this is uh, as a second example. It looks similar. Um, it has similar uh, markings. Um, a lot of these barracks also have like blue roofs, but I don't think that's an indicator. And this is a, a third example. Uh, I think this is uh, the detention camp in Aksu. Um, it's a bit smaller, but like this is how like the data look like. These are like how the satellite images look like from above. So this is how we we uh, got there basically. So we had like we started with nothing, then we ended up with like a bunch of like uh, uh, squares, and then we ended up with like a list of um, um, satellite images. And what we got out of it is like um, we could make a, a certain statement about like what we believe is happening in the province of Xinjiang. So we could find like 428 locations that like bear the hallmarks of prisons or detention centers. And Alison Killing being an architect, of course, like she also uh, measured the, the, the space that these uh, camps uh, take and could like calculate that like the sheer size of this uh, system would hold up to a million people, just like the, the sizing of like the, 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 the uh, spaces. And what we could also uh, see is that at some point, I believe it was 2016 or 2017, a lot of these camps were built. So before that, like a lot of these detention centers uh, uh, were like placed in temporary uh, locations, old schools, old factories, something that was available. But there was a moment when the policy changed and these uh, um, uh, internment camps were built. And, and this is like something that we could detect. Um, the data was basically roughly put into three different types of categories. Like from the, all the data that uh, uh, the researcher looked at, like you can basically make three categories. So the one is like the stuff that uh, uh, we are certain. This is all um, uh, satellite images of uh, internment camps where we have a second channel of verification. Somebody who was there and could uh, take a photo or somebody who was like in prison and could like give a witness, a witness statement about it. Um, the second category is like likely camps. We believe they are, but we have no second uh, channel of verification. And the third one is like, we are unsure, but maybe somebody else can do something with it. Um, and what for me personally is also very interesting that on the one hand, like the output was like a series of articles and that's like the narrative that we uh, uh, tell, but like uh, the output was also data again. So we start with data and we output data again. And this data can then again be used as an as a input for other data research. Um, and um, this is what I want to show. Like, so this is a very um, uh, crazy story. So there is this man he lived in China and he actually used our uh, list of uh, camps that we published and he actually drove there and started to take footage and like try to like document uh, actually like uh, what it is that like uh, hides behind these like uh, uh, pins on the map and the satellite images. And he uh, made a video, it's like around 20 minutes long. It's very interesting to see. Alison also did like a long Twitter thread where she compared his video footage with the results and like really showing up like the markings of the detention centers. And this is super interesting. But what I want to show you maybe um, is like five minutes of this uh, uh, footage. It's in total like 20 minutes. And just to give you an idea of like how the aesthetics of these camps are, like how it looks like. Um, 之前在BuzzFeed News上看过一篇报道 说是通过对比卫星地图确认了许多新疆集中营的位置路目骑士及周边有着非常多的标记我只去查看这条路的南侧还有多大的 So here goes around the corner and you can start to see the walling and the fences and the guard towers Also observe like how long this is like just to, to understand the, the dimension of this regime like everything you see here on the left side is part of the, the, the complex.
乌鲁木齐市南边的这个红色标记，实际上是西山拘留所。进入雅山公园，爬到山顶，可以很容易看到其位置所在。有一个玻璃门上贴着“五间区”的字样，建筑物有突出的玻璃天窗，推测被关押的人只能在建筑物里放风不起眼的小路，啊，所以只能爬上山头拍摄，还不敢站立拍摄，怕被人注意到。军营门口还摆了两辆坦克，远看还以为是天安门撵人的那一款，其实不是。这一片区域不止一个军营，周围的建筑可能是营房或者别的附属设施。可以看到院内停了很多军用卡车，应该驻扎了不少党卫军在这里。在这些军营的背后，更远的地方可以看到有围墙的铁丝网守卫塔，那里就是集中营位置所在。Okay. Um, so I want to come back to like my previous question: What is data-driven investigation really? And I before said like data-driven investigation is defined through doing data investigation. Um, and so I can only answer the question from my point of view as a programmer. I'm not an investigator. I'm not a storyteller. I'm not a designer. But like I build tools for data investigation and I collaborate with uh, people that do this kind of work. Um, I think it's super, super important. It's really I cannot like uh, state it often enough that it's really important that like different disciplines come together. Like I, as a program alone, I cannot do data-driven investigation. I can only do it together with designers, with uh, investigators, with people who look at the aesthetic, at the meaning, at the context of things. Um, and because I'm also working a lot with journalists, and like uh, lately I'm speaking more to journalists than I ever did before, but like uh, one thing is also very important for journalists to understand is like uh, practitioners of data investigation are mostly not found in newsrooms. Um, there's a lot of people who do this kind of work who are like uh, uh, interested and are great partners and collaborators, but they are not working in a newsroom because there is, there is no uh, education for data investigators. There is no job title. Like it's very hard to have like a very rigid like or like old structure and like expect that these people come out of this structure. It's like these people come out of new structures that don't exist, but like they're very happy to work with journalists in this case. Um, and I think it's also very important to understand that like uh, if you do data investigation, everybody who collaborates here has to be an equal person. Um, like uh, one thing you should not do is like outsource your core compet uh, competencies. Don't think of like uh, uh, the person who writes your software as being like the IT guy that like, I don't know, sits in a corner and you don't talk to this person. Like you have to involve everybody who's involved in this project like on an equal uh, basis because like it's the expertise that you're looking for. Um, it's like the, the, the insight and the creativity that these different fields can bring together. Um, it's also like, uh, in terms of journalism, it's interesting that like, um, uh, that this is also getting more and more recognized, of course. Programmers don't tend to win journalistic awards. That's not a thing that happened, but it starts to happen now. Like, and that's also something that journalists do have to realize that like, if you do want to continue doing this work, that like, it does help to involve these different people into your journalistic work, and that it's not like an either-or situation, but it's really like a situation where you have to work together. 
And maybe also just like to sum it up again, like um, in this research we started from like not knowing anything, then we knew something and we could use it as a stepping stone to then know more. And that's also something that you do often in data-driven investigation. You start with at one place and you use it as a way to bootstrap your way to a different place. And that's like a very important difference also when I say like there was data and there's data-driven. And I think this is like a, 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 an attribute of like data-driven investigation that you can use data then again to then like uh, elevate yourself to a different place and a different uh, uh, sphere of like uh, information and knowledge. Um, why I think that data-driven investigation is very interesting also for journalists is that like often I feel like journalists are working very much with like uh, uh, witness statements, with anecdotes, like uh, they hear a story from a person and those anecdotes are super important. These witness statements are actually like the, the, the they set the framing and they you know, make us understand what it means what we are talking about. So they are very, very important. But I think like to add to this, like uh, if we can then also like show how systemic something is, that's like then you really hit it. Like then you can really like prove on the one hand like uh, the dimension of something that is happening, and you can also show like why it matters and why it's a terrible thing that we're talking about. And it's a combination of both things that I think like data-driven investigation allows us. And I think that's uh, that's a very interesting um, aspect. So as a last thing, I think I'm over time a little bit. I'm not sure actually, but um, uh, because I'm a software developer and I build tools, like I build tools for many many years. So I want to just like uh, give like. Um, um, I don't know, like a parting insight from, from my last years. Um, you can take it or not, I don't care. But uh, basically, I make a distinction between two types of tools. Like when I build something for data investigation, there's like two things that we, I'm talking about. So one is like something that I call a general purpose tools, and they are gold. Like if we have a general purpose tool, they're like incredibly valuable. Like these are tools that we can like use again and again uh, for uh, different projects. So we have to learn them once, and then we can use them again. And those are tools that we can like repurpose for different uh, use cases, depending on like what it is that we want to do. There's only very few tools that are available um, that do this, but they're very, very useful, and we should learn them well. But as a tool builder, those are the hardest tools to build. Like it's very rare that you build a tool that is actually really general purpose. And if you actually want to do this, then, then suddenly your problem space of like building a tool changes uh, rapidly because then suddenly becomes a problem of maintenance, of uh, uh, a, a problem of generality, a problem of uh, uh, making it work in every situation for every person, for every uh, uh, use case. And that's a very, very hard problem and very resource intensive. You have to put a lot of money into it in order to make this happen. And the second type of tools uh, that I think is actually like the type of tools that we're going to uh, build uh, most of the time, it's something that I call ephemeral tools. They're just like temporary tools. They're tools that like we make them, they have a purpose, we use them for this purpose, they fulfill the purpose and we throw them away. Like all the work that went into it, we just throw them away, we don't care about it anymore. And when we need something similar again, we build them again from scratch. And uh, the reason why we do this is because like it is much easier and less resource intensive to build these kind of ephemeral tools. And in data investigation, like um, resources are a problem, they're scarce. And, and technology is not something, a problem where you just throw money at it either. Like uh, even if you have a lot of money, like we tend, to, like uh, um, it's not so easy to actually make it work. And I think like as a strategy in a resource constrained environment, um, be, like thinking in ephemeral tools has a, like, a, has, like a high level of, uh, like a high potential of success. If you think in general tools, like you're going to have like a really, really book, uh, big project at your hand. And of course, sometimes that's what you want, and that's fine, and that's great if you can do it. But I think like very, very often, most of the tools that we use, we really have to think of them as one-time tools. If you're, I don't know if anybody ever did carpentry, but like I once uh, uh, built a staircase out of wood. And before we actually started building the staircase and cutting like planks and like beams and everything, we actually built little wedges and molds that we used in order to cut the, the, the wood. And we did this because then we created a tool in order to use our other tools on it. And then once we cut all the wood and we used these wedges or these molds, we threw them away. They were useless. You cannot reuse them anymore because they were just built for one single purpose and that's what we used them for. And there's no maintenance involved and we can just like do it and be done with it. And I think that's a very, very um, a good thing. So for this research, we have like uh, general purpose tools that we use this Excel. It's like 
really good for a lot of things, not just budgets. I use it a lot like to actually look at data. It's very useful. And of course, Google Earth is like a fantastic uh, tool if you're like into uh, satellite imagery. But then of course, the ephemeral tools that we used for this research are like the scraper to get the data and this verification UI. And this uh, verification UI is something that I keep on building. Like there is no general solution to this problem because like uh, every research requires a different type of verification and outcome. And therefore like I tend to start again and again and rebuild like every verification UI for every project and not like reuse the same thing or not even try to make one UI that tries to rule them all. That's, I, I don't think there, there, there's a lot of like success in this. So thank you a lot. Um, yeah. Them, I have to be being pawing between you two. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much for your super interesting um, talks. I was wondering, um, I wanted to ask you both the same thing. Um, have you been, I mean, you just won a Pulitzer, so <laughs> congratulations for that. You've been working uh, on um, on uh, detecting war crimes evidence for quite a few years. And uh, we are now in the middle of what some people call the first, like, you know, big um, uh, cyber world war, where a lot of important material is coming out every day. And, um, and also, most countries um, are defining their ability to uh, charge Russia with uh, war crimes <laughs> in real time. So you both make tools that would be useful for that. Have you been called by any newspaper? Oh, yeah, sure. Podemos tener otro micro? Not by a newspaper yet, but I've certainly started working on this um, right up until the moment I caught my flight here to develop the tools a little more specifically for the munitions that are appearing in Ukraine. The important thing to know is not all of them are useful. It's, for example, not useful to know that someone has an AK-47 because everyone has an AK-47. It doesn't tell you anything new. And the reason that I'm detecting these very specific munitions is because I've been told by the researchers, um, human rights researchers working with Mnemonic, that these are very, um, you know, like important from a legal perspective if you can prove that they were used because these uh, munitions, it becomes a little more complex but violate the uh, convention on cluster munitions. However, the U.S. nor Russia are, none of them are signatories of it. So whether it actually can go to the International Criminal Court and lead to a war crime charge against Putin is not clear. But it shouldn't stop anyone from gathering enough evidence and trying to put together a convincing case. And each image that's found is one more um, you know, in addition to that legal case, one more page in that stack of legal documents that proves the wrongdoing. So it's very important to find every single one. 
and in doing so, you create uh, you know, an overwhelming picture of wrongdoing, of uh, violation of human rights, or of a war crime. So not exactly uh, directly with newspapers, but things are quite um, entangled in that when it becomes more of a story, then it's uh, important to connect with a newspaper about it. And I think at this stage, for me at least, you know, um, I guess there's probably a difference. I don't want to <laughs> set us apart, but I'm, I'm not looking for a story in my work or I'm not working directly on that angle. I, I mean, I would like to, but I'm really approaching it as a technologist and trying to develop a tool that is complex and that can be used in a simple way to compress complexity and, uh, you know, abundance and data into a manageable, useful amount and insight that leads to an action. And then it's often the, the group I work with who, coincidentally, Crystal worked with, and I'm kind of um, dealing with, Crystal collected so much data when he worked with this group that I'm now faced with this task of um, sorting through all of that, which is a problem that extends to, it, it just like generally extends to the internet uh, in the way that so many videos are published online and you can't keep up with it. And you really do need better tools to manage and filter all of that information, to put it into the, um, you know, onto the desk of journalists or human rights researchers or lawyers. Um, and there's a, a huge growing community of people, especially now that the conflict has come much closer, the war in Ukraine, and it's a lot more urgent and a lot more people are involved and it's become, um, in my perspective, less of a uncertain area. This is certainly not everyone wants to deal with conflict zones. Um, it can be, you know, quite psychologically difficult if you look at a lot of it. And, but now it's in your face every day and you can't really get away from it. So in a way it's normalized the practice of looking through it in order to collect insights and to help uh, other people and to form a community of researchers in order to build a story or a legal case from that. Of course, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm right thinking this uh, or I might be wishful thinking, but um, would it be possible, and I'm thinking as a journalist, of course, because it's all that I am, um, would it be possible for a TV station that has people on the, on the on the spot, <laughs> recording and receiving a man, like a lot of audiovisual material from uh, from the war zones, maybe from collaborators or even people uh, from different platforms, etc., to be detecting um, a given I don't know cluster munition or uh, any of the elements that constitute war crimes, <laughs> because you know they are technologies for weapons that are not meant to be used against humans anymore or ever, and um, would it be a, 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 like um, a technology that could be detecting in real time all this material for journalistic purposes, because it would resolve puzzles that take a long time uh, to resolve for it to, you know, simple humans, apart from what you just mentioned of, um, of exposing them to really nasty material in the first place. But also uh, we're dealing with a war as with anywhere, I guess, where um, time is a factor <laughs> that we can measure in lives. So as soon as we can establish that war crimes against humanity are being committed, the less people will die, te technically, I mean, hopefully. So, um, so why aren't all the people that are making these materials uh, using a tool like yours? That's what I wonder. Why is not your tool in every newspaper? Um, because it just <laughs> finished. <laughs> it's oh, new. okay. Um, the, I was assuming it was our fault. <laughs> no, and I think the, the challenge is in figuring out what to do once this technology exists and how do you bridge it with a group of journalists because you can get the output and you can format it in various ways as um, different types of structured data, but what do you do with that? So you still need, um, like Krista mentioned, a verification system that provides a UI to interface with the data 
of, for example, a, compu a computer vision system. Because um, the V-frame can process a lot, but you still need to monitor that in some way. And I think the you know, urgently needed tool, something that I'm working on, is how do you bring in as much data as you can in real time and provide the useful output in real time, and what does that look like? Um, and there are actually only a few really important munitions that are that fit the profile of what computer vision can do and are unique enough that they'll have a high hit rate and a low false positive. And those are the ones that urgently need to be you know, 3D modeled and built into training data sets and then turned into this model. And the models, as I mentioned, this model zoo, which is the sort of jargon for like a collection of different specific models that you can deploy. And the like the actual processing is a general tool. It just, you take videos in, then you do something to it. But you need a certain model. And it could be looking at, um, you know, general things. It could be looking for, oh, I don't know, a cat, right? Um, the worst example to give, but also the most common example in many generic detectors is all of these quite generic objects from the internet that have almost zero relevance to journalistic work. And there's such a huge distance between all of the commercial imagery online and the types of things that you want to detect for real research projects. And that's kind of the, the game-changing quality of synthetic data is that you can introduce um, a training data set for anything you want. So, and it can also be spun up fairly quickly. So I think the new models for specific to Ukraine uh, which would be sub, uh, cluster munitions, submunitions from this RBK 500 will be ready in a matter of weeks. And then, um, yeah, it's a matter of interfacing it with some kind of UI verification tool. And then, so we'll just go in this order right here, actually. That would be nice. <laughs> but maybe to come back to your previous question about like, um, so the. Ukraine conflict is very interesting because like never before was data analyzed and verified in real time. Like Ukraine is really unique, it's the first time. So Syria was the first real big conflict where this kind of like uh, permanent documentation took place, but the, the, the ingestion of this data was always uh, delayed by some time, like people were not that quick. Ukraine seems to be like the thing, like I'm, I'm amazed at like how fast people are going through the, the imagery, the videos, the tweets and stuff like this. So there is a machinery already running that, that is like trained, that like knows how to deal it. People have experiences and they apply it now in Ukraine and very successfully. But I think um, we should also like uh, consider that like when we talk about human rights violations, of course, um, speed is not everything. And most uh, work in human rights, especially when we talk about court cases, they're like very slow and they always happen like afterwards. Like, I mean, realistically speaking, I think the work is very, very important, but like, if we find a tweet and we can detect this is like this type of ammunition, it didn't stop this ammunition from dropping. And uh, also, if there's anything to be learned from Syria, it will also not stop the ammunition from dropping again. So it is very interesting to have this kind of analysis, and it's very, very important, but uh, I think that a big part of this uh, job, um, or a part of this job, is actually like a slow-moving job. And, and I think both are very relevant things. So I think this like real-time analysis is super interesting because we need to know and we want to know. But there's also then a second uh, uh, step that basically uh, goes at it and looks at it like in a much, much slower pace with a very different like goal and, and, and purpose. I see. So um, now that it's been three weeks uh, since the invasion started, and knowing like, you know, the different projects that you have been involved in and that you have developed for, um, what opportunities do you see in the m different materials that are coming out? Like, do you ever think about, you see the, I don't know, footage or, or information that comes uh, through the internet and think, oh, I could do something with that. Like, have you been, has, has something popped out? Is there any particular source that you find particularly interesting? Like me, for instance, I'm obsessed with planet.com and all the satellite imagery and how it can um, become like a map of, like a trace map of all the destruction that is being, uh, you know, deployed over the days just by comparis comparing one day to the next. 
did, have you, I mean, what, what comes to mind? What, what, what would be your point of entry in this conflict? Um, well, um, so maybe one thing, like, I mean, dealing with huge amounts of data as we did in Syria and as we uh, do now with Ukraine, it's, it, it poses a lot of challenges. Like, uh, so the Syrian archive definitely faced a challenge of, like, we have so much data, we, we don't know what to do. And, like, uh, tools like Adam Harvey would then come in and have the promise where we can, like, uh, we can help you with the complexity of the amount of data. But I think very often also, like, um, what is interesting to consider is that, like, uh, uh, while it's good to have all this data, sometimes we don't need all the data in, all, in order to make a case. So if you want to talk about, like, a specific event that happened, if I have 10 videos showing that one event, then maybe I can stop. Maybe I don't need 11 video or I need a 12th video, right? But these 10 videos that you want to have, they have to be, like, good quality and they have to, like, really, like, document what happened and show, like, really, like, give you this narrative story, like, just gives you like the complete picture so that like no that there is no doubt anymore so i think like what will be interesting in ukraine is that of course like uh, we thought syria was producing a lot of data and ukraine is now just like uh, like it's it's again like a different like uh, uh, level in, in that regard and i think what will come out is that like there is more data but it also means there will be more high quality data if i like to be like very technical now like of course like uh, uh, the things that we see are very um, horrible, but uh, I think it will, on the long term, just help us like to to have like stronger cases to show what actually happened, and like uh, try not to leave any doubt about it. I just wanted to circle back to um, one thing you said in the earlier question, which is uh, around: you know, is there a way to coordinate with people to get them to document more? And there are. A lot of similarities, but some differences between Syria and Ukraine. And one is that internet has been shut down in certain regions. And so there won't be any documentation for a while, but there could be a burst of documentation. And there could be also, um, if people realize that there are a lot of OSINT or human rights researchers and journalists looking at the material, they may be incentivized to create more. But there's also a risk that needs to be communicated to people on the ground that documenting submunitions is risky. And unless you know specifically which ones they are, um, you have a high risk of a dangerous encounter or exploding it because some of them can be triggered electromagnetically or by proximity sensors. So unless you know specifically that it is a 9N235 submunition, then you should really not get much closer to it unless you have certainty. So uh, this is something that I didn't realize until later on in, in discussing with more people about, yeah, it would be good to collect more evidence. It's also more training data. And the more data that the other side has, they have a bigger window and more perspectives into what's going on. But there's also a risk that needs to be communicated with people in conflict zones so they don't put themselves in harm's way when they're documenting things for researchers who are sitting safely in another region. Just a small thing to add also, like, I mean, we always, um, and especially programmers, like, they, they always uh, think in, in, in the happy path. Like, we always try to think of the scenario that makes us all happy. And the, the happy path in this case is, like, we get, like, a lot of, like, high-quality, good documentation so that we can understand what is happening and that also, like, later on, um, some sort of justice can be maybe approached uh, eventually. But, of course, like, uh, this huge amount of data also means, like, the amount of data that is, like, fake or is like easy to misinterpret uh, it will also like uh, increase. So like uh, not only do we get more data that we have to like digest and look at, but also the amount of data that we have to like uh, discard because it's obviously like not right data, like will also increase. And that's a problem. That's like the unhappy path. Like this is something that of course we also have to deal with uh, in this case. And I think um, it already happened in Syria from what I remember. Uh, and of course, like in this conflict uh, with Russia being like uh, having a, a very different like infrastructure, um, this, this will just intensify and, and um, it has to be seen what's gonna happen. And I think there has been like at least one right in the first day or second day, like a, a missile attack on, like a, on, on, um, on a residential building in Kiev. And I think people were immediately quickly saying this was like a Russian bombardment. And some people were like, no, 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 wait a minute. This looks a little bit fishy. It could be actually like a very, very different story behind it. And I think like, of course, the problem with like this like real-time interpretation, you make a lot of mistake. And that's fine. Like if you do something quick 
it's, it's okay to make a mistake, but like you have to be able to then get back to it later on and look at it like uh, with like a perspective and distance and see like was I right or was I not right? Like, and I think that's an important aspect then. Yeah, when it, when it comes to verification, I was wondering what sources would be clean from, from origin, no? And I was wondering if the kind of materials that you are searching on VFrame would be, for instance, visible from a satellite, because, I mean, sa like military-grade satellites have a degree of precision <laughs> on the ground. I wonder if it would be that precise. I don't know exactly how precise these satellites can be. I think it's quite hard to get access to that resolution. Um, but what we know is the resolution is going to keep increasing, and that in the future, there's going to be better access to higher quality satellite information from private companies, probably, and also from, um, you could imagine, a kind of quadcopter drone flying into a conflict zone and doing a survey of the area and then bringing that back for analysis later. This is something that's already happening to some extent. So, I mean, what's interesting, um, you know, from the synthetic data perspective, again, is that you can remodel it to work, <clears throat> excuse me, from an aerial perspective. So everything has to be, you have to encode the way that people are looking at the object. And in most cases, that's with a smartphone, and you figure the average human height, and sometimes bending down to get a close-up. That all needs to be encoded in order to get a good performance model the way that people are observing it. So that, that switches, and it becomes actually a little bit cleaner. Satellites are very calibrated. It's always the same sensor that's collecting it, and it's very calibrated. Whereas you have so many different kinds of smartphones that are collecting it, and it's compressed when it goes to um, a social media platform. So there's no calibration. There's no chance for getting a, you know, that high quality. Uh, yeah, the satellite imagery. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They would be clean in terms of sensor, and then we'd be clean in terms of verification. Right, so when that resolution increases, there are going to be a lot more opportunities. Already so many different computer vision technologies are working on satellite imagery. And I think uh, it's not something actually I've looked at too much yet. But I've done enough uh, prototyping with quadcopter type footage that you can, it's pretty absurd how accurately you can detect a person uh, who is about the size of an ant from a quadcopter footage with really good accuracy. And the number of uh, computer vision libraries to detect at w using high resolution imagery, 4K imagery from a quadcopter is also increasing. So these, these two um, you know, developments are coming to a head that points towards really strong capabilities for aerial surveillance, which in, from the perspective of conflict zone monitoring is good, but there's also the flip side of that, which is very pervasive, ubiquitous surveillance for any purpose. I'm tempted to open uh, for questions. I don't know how are we doing time-wise. But what are your favorite sources of data? Like the ones that are, I don't know if cleaner, but maybe the more, the richer sources of data for this kind of investigation? Um, I mean, Obviously, satellite imagery is extremely powerful. Like, there's a lot to be gained from satellite imagery, and I think um, we're only starting to see. Um, I think it's the beginning there because, like, the commercial satellites are getting like better and better, and uh, the precision gets higher and higher. And I think we can use this more and more. And also, like, this uh, imagery is more available. Like, in the 90s, like, uh, we had no access to satellite imagery, but then the then a policy change and like uh, the US decided satellite imagery has to be a private sector and that's why we have access to this now so their reason was like so they can present satellite imagery without revealing the military capability they have so that was the reason why we have a private sector of satellite imagery and I think that's super interesting I think social media as as annoying as it is I think it's still like a very important source but it's also the source that is very very messy like you produce a huge amount of data and and you don't know what you're going to get. And I think like most of social media is probably like not to be trusted. But 
but still it is a very good source because it is what people experience directly. Like it is like one of these very, very important sources. Um, but I think sometimes it's also really just like um, newspaper articles. So like another project that I did is like we were scraping media articles in order to get certain types of information. And in order to get to these media articles, we use Google search. Plain and simple, something that you can do manually. And then of course you can just like do it massively as well if you use a machine for it. Like, uh, so I think there's like a lot of sources of data that we can think of. Um, and the good thing about data investigation is like uh, it gives us the methods and the methodologies to combine this data. And I think that's also like uh, maybe something to keep in mind. Don't use one source of data, use multiple sources of data and, and, and see what sticks. Do you have any? Uh, social media is the obvious go-to for collecting uh, free, cheap, sometimes good quality, sometimes low quality data. I think the, the next, um, you know, what's next in line is to form uh, partnerships and collaborations with people who have access to the conflict zone safely and to do a uh, survey uh, captures and to work more directly with the people in those locations to obtain the data, do it in a safe way also, and to not become too reliant and addicted to social media as the provider of a ground truth because it's not reliable. It can be, but it's not a reliable, stable source of that data. So I think it's, it's also very comfortable to sit back and, and collect data that way. And I think the, the, there, does, there needs to be some work done in forming new partnerships uh, with uh, the very brave uh, people, uh, humanitarian groups that go into harm's way and to help show them how some surveying tools can help collect data and even um, present a ground truth of that location. And that that, that can be further analyzed using both manual and automatic tools. Um, maybe, because I, I, I totally agree. Like social media is very unreliable and we have to be very careful with it. And I think like one approach that some civil society organizations are taking is to create like um, custom applications, mobile applications that they give to people. And these applications have a different way of collecting the data that they're interested in that are like, more vetted or like have certain safeguards uh, included and like there has been a few attempts in the past to build these kind of applications and I would say the success rate was like so-so and but I, I do see like uh, these projects are keep like they they come up again and again because it is like one way that people think it could work if you have like a uh, collection tools that are like more purposeful or more like focused on the task that maybe this would like increase the quality of the data Another big problem is the admissibility of data in a, in a legal situation. So it's hard to prove whether an image on social media is real or not. And then sometimes you need, I've heard, a photo of someone taking the photo in order to verify that the photo is real, which is an absurd requirement, especially in a conflict zone, even in reality. And uh, these apps are, I think, if they can be communicated and if people are comfortable and if they have good um, design and user experience to make it easy enough and not a burden to collect data in that way, then that does provide a um, kind of certified provenance of the documentation. So that overcomes the problems and limitations of social media as a legally admissible form of documentation. I think... Um when we talk about social media, like uh, we started from a place where we said like everybody is an authority, right? Every data is to be trusted and, and that's okay. And I think like especially when we talk about legal requirements, like um, uh, legal entities, they like authority. Like that's why you have like specialists who are called into court and testify and they're specialists in an area. And if they say something, then it's admissible in court, uh, it's, it's like acceptable in courts and, uh, in, and, and it's an authority. And I think what we're also gonna see is like a pickup of like certain structures. It can be either organization, for example, the OPCW is an organization that is like an authority on chemical attacks. 
Um, I think we're going to see more authorities that basically provide data for these kind of cases and are being like fed through like these unreliable, unreliable sources and have a process to basically digest this and make this like a, a source of truth in the end. But this is, isn't this more or less what forensic architecture is doing? Collecting all this different information, these layers of information, or as they say, pinning all these layers of different information, a lot of them coming from social media into a, a space or a building or um, a scenario of uh, war crimes and then, and then creating this narrative around all this material for justice uh, uh, purposes. I mean, I don't know, I don't know if that, I, I mean, I, I am conflicted into in in how this method is entirely like in its you know format useful for journalistic purposes, even though they're already collaborating with uh, the New York Times and with the Washington Post and stuff, and and there is like a clear aesthetic <laughs> that 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 is being now replicated uh, in the media that is a very distinct um, forensics uh, or forensic architecture aesthetic, but I wonder what the difference it is in, in terms of, um, of, of the journalistic approach. Uh, and, um, and also it bothers me that when we're using tools for analyzing and filtering this kind of materials, um, there is a, a fiction of objectivity or cleanliness. Uh, I mean, you've been working on the, on the, um, uh, the, the ideas around AI and how they play uh, games with us in, in this context. So um, do you see, uh, it's, you, you are both artists uh, working on this, on this uh, topic for a long time. Do you see ways uh, where the uh, credibility of your tools results could be dangerous in that regard? I don't know if I've explained myself. That was a bit of a meandering question. I would say, like I speak for myself, I think um, the tools that I'm building, like what comes out of it, like, uh, it, like it's, it's, there's always a, a, um, a danger that suddenly like it's not valid anymore. I think this is just like uh, how it is. I think maybe what would help is like if we focus more on methods and less on tools. I think like um, ideally, the tools follow the methods and we define the methods first and we have like a way of verifying that the methodology itself uh, is solid or like solid within the framing that we have because that's also like a thing like if I publish an article I don't know like in in, in uh, Austrian online newspaper I have a different framing than when I go to the ICC and accuse somebody of genocide that's a very different framing and you have to apply very different like uh, uh, methods in order to come to a conclusion um, and so, but I think like if you start with the methods, and this is, I think is just like how research probably has been done before, like um, that like uh, focus on the methodology and then build the tools to support your methodology. I think that's maybe like a way to deal with this issue, yeah. Yeah, well, one of the things that I got from both your talks was that um, you are very keen on focusing on the problem before the solution. It's just like this, um, Let's say that the, uh, the big tech company's approach is all, always to build a tool that absorbs as much data as possible. And then it's always a tool in search of a problem, <laughs> no? Like tools looking for a problem to resolve. And then the solution always ends up having the shape of the tool, no? Like the tool defines um, the problem and the solution. And in your case, I see that you're both working from the problem perspective. like you're you're creating solutions for specific problems. I guess the danger for that is creating only ephemeral tools, uh, the way you described uh, at the end of your talk, that uh, your tools will always be serving that one purpose. But um, it would seem to me that, uh, that all your tools are useful for that one purpose with um, very different objectives, no? And very different contexts. Like the one, the, the, the protocol that you developed using maps or the searching, like you, you're kind of, I, I kind of call it like clear view for a uh, nasty weapons <laughs> tool. So um, uh, what are the new, like what, do, 
What new purposes do you imagine uh, those tools that you have built uh, would have in the next few months or maybe a few years? Do you see life after, <laughs> after that uh, particular well, context? Uh, I'm a pessimist, so I don't know. But like, um, I would say like when we, I think it's a natural thing as a program, and I can speak for myself, of course, and um, I guess it will be similar for you, but like programmers, they like to solve problems. Like they always look at something and they see a problem that can be solved. It's like it's a very, it's, it's a natural thing like uh, that you don't look at really like the problem, but you just look at immediately at the solution. And I think like one thing that helped me personally to overcome this um, gut reaction is like to overthink of like the trade-offs first. I think like uh, when we think about like digital tools, like uh, people tend to overthink like what do I win with it? What can I do suddenly, right? But actually every tool that you build, you also codify a trade-off. You lose something with everything that you do. And this is like more true with digital tools than with anything else. And I think like um, it's very good to think about like what do we win? I think that's a very important question, but I think we always have to uh, at the same time ask the question, what do we lose when we do it this way and when we have this tool? And is the price worth it? And I think that's a very, very important question. I think if we start asking this question as well, then we take a step back from like just looking at the solutions and also actually consider the problem because then we have to balance the problem and we have to like think about like what it is that we want that comes out of it at the end. I'm going to open the um, conversation to our audience. Is there any questions? Okay. Do we have... Yes, we do. I will hope. Uh, yes, I would like to know about the uh, legal barriers because, for example, Cristo had a very clear example in China with the legal barrier, which was the, those spaces being censored on the internet. So I wanted to know if you will have this similar problem here in our freer internet, which will be like, for example, in the privacy legislation, which will make like more difficult to access those data. So. We see in China clearly the example, but maybe we have the same issues here, but in a different way. Um, I think like uh, when we scrape, like one thing that we, um, like scraping is always a gray zone, like legally, like, and uh, to be honest, and luckily I'm not a lawyer because maybe I would have to stop doing it otherwise. Um, the one problem that I saw with a lot of data is that like, copyright is an issue for us. Uh, specifically with the Syrian Archive, I know that like, a lot of data that the Syrian Archive collected was taken down from the platforms because of copyright violations. And then suddenly like, this data disappeared. So we, uh, we did actually like, uh, track this and I had a method to actually detect how much of the data disappears. And it was like on YouTube, I think like between 12 and 20% of the data, depending on the platform. Um, and very often this data was not taken away for a specific reason, but just because like a algorithm, a computer process just said like, I remove it now. And Google has this approach of like, remove it first and then see if anybody complains. And most of the time people don't complain and then it just stays like this. And then specifically with uh, this case, like uh, because we could track this and we could complain, they actually restored a lot of it again. But like the reason why it was taken down initially was like copyright violations. And this was mostly because like somewhere in the background, a song was playing, for example, that, uh, that had a copyright and was like not licensed or whatever. Like, uh, but scraping like data, like the getting the data, like not the, everything that follows, but like getting the data sometimes has uh, issues where we scratch like uh, the, the questions of like what is legal and what is not. And there have been also situations uh, where I said like I will not do this because like um, f for legal reasons or ethical reasons. So there, there's a legal um, a component and of course there's an ethical component as well. Like, uh, um, yeah. Any other question? Hi, thank you. Um, do you have any specific tools to scheme the, for example, uh, social media in order to gather data, not just for sources, but more for training an algorithm for detecting this kind of objects? For pulling the data, for scraping, that's kind of Christo's department. Okay. 
in archive, that's kind of like what we did. So the tools that were in use there, that like I developed there, were basically meant to like scrape data from like, I think in the end it was 10 or 11 different sources. So this was like from YouTube to Twitter to Facebook, like all different kind of things. So this tool existed, like many people like um, build these tools and like a lot of those platforms, for example, like Twitter, it's actually quite easy to get the data because they do provide you access that where you can have legal access to the data. You just don't have access to historical data. Um, so I think there's a lot of tools in different varieties, uh, from graphical interfaces to browser plugins to like command line tools. Um, I think there's also like, uh, if we think about tools, um, it also helps to think through like the whole process of what it is you want to, uh, to do with the data. Because for example, just getting the tweet very often is not enough. You also have to like move the tweet into a different process because like, of course you can save it on in a screenshot or like the text on your hard disk, but then what do you do with it afterwards? So I think like if you want to choose any tools for a research, like think about like the whole process, the whole pipeline of data that you want to build and where data comes from where it has to go through and where it has to end up in order for you to be useful. And I think like then these different tools can align and they make more sense. And then you can make a judgment call about like what kind of tool to choose and which not. And I'll just add, and knowing that there are people and programs working on this challenge and this problem, I decided to decouple the work that I'm doing from the data collection part of the process and focus specifically on the data analysis at a very specific kind of visual. There's also, as I mentioned, there are so many different AI, um, fancy, shiny objects to look at and algorithms. And it's quite easy to get distracted because there's the possibility of doing audio analysis on the cluster munitions going off. And actually Microsoft work on a project about that. And you can also look at the more temporal qualities of to do uh, like, you know, over multiple frames analysis. And I just decided to try and I guess divide and conquer and focus on one thing and try to do that really well. And that wanted to also counter a little bit something you said, or it's often perceived in a use pejoratively, the uh, having a solution in search of a problem. I think it's really important for some of these tools to be ready to go because when a conflict emerges, it sometimes takes a really long time before people learn about everything that's happening. And this is something that I've been uh, working towards is to expand these collections of models called the Model Zoo in order to make it more applicable to if a future scenario were to erupt so I've been talking with a lot of international organizations about which regions they see potential for conflict and then thinking about which munitions are already used there, who are the weapon suppliers, and what are the likely scenarios that could emerge, and then having a solution ready for the problem. Well, actually, actually those weapons are built, designed, <laughs> painted by people, uh, by companies, no? Do you think there would be a possibility of those companies releasing mm, deliver willingly, deliberately <laughs> uh, sufficient uh, data around these weapons for you to use in the frame. I think they have less than zero interest in... Yeah, in yeah, I mean, of course, but, um, but what if it was like a legal request? Yeah, I, I have looked at a lot of catalogs for the weapons companies, and they just don't seem to be overlapping much with the human rights groups and researchers that are trying to undo a lot of what the mess that they've created. So the people that are interesting to work with are just a lot of the international aid organizations, and I've tried to, um, like, um, yeah, meet and um, work with people in just a little more diverse groups. So I went to, presented this project in Geneva last November to the uh, Mine Action Technology Workshop. And it was, I guess they hadn't quite seen something like this. And it's not the most exciting place 
to work in, although I find it pretty exciting the first time I went there, the kinds of technologies that are being used. It's a pretty serious business, and you get a lot of long-term companies uh, because there's a lot of uh, reputational challenges in working in this field, so it's not often that a newcomer uh, drops by <laughs> for a coffee at the Mine Action Technology Workshop. Um, but I think this is exactly what I was referring to before. There's, it might be quite uncomfortable in the beginning, but I think these are the opportunities that are really worth pursuing, is getting, stepping away from the computer and out of your comfortable office chair and just going and do things that might not work out and then seeing where they lead to. So that's, that's I mean, where I'm trying to head with the VFrame project is to really need to meet people and make relationships and then you know, move towards the real reality, not just the social media reality, and see if you can even, um, you know, plan ahead and, and start preparing things in advance, rather than um, like a just-in-time solution or not not quite in time solution. Test. Hi, my question has to do with the synthetic training data and, and the 3D modeling that you were using. You didn't get into how you avoid bias in that training data because I assume you're drawing on existing videos and pictures and images of what you know a half-exploded bomb is looking like. How do you avoid the fact that you only have the ones you've detected and there may be undetected bombs out there that you should be looking for in, in the future, right? I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that kind of in inherent bias in, in your available, um, the model for your synthetic training data, I guess. Uh, that is something that I've thought about. That's uh, You've really skipped ahead with that question because you can only know as far as what you've seen so far. This is why it's really important to look at all the videos that you can to understand the context. And there are many variables to that context. I realize everything from the you know, how much motion blur, what quality of cameras, what's the megapixel resolution, the type of lens, is it zoomed in, is it overhead? Um, are people using DSLRs? I had the problem where I received photos from a, a DSLR, so like a prosumer, professional level camera, and there was so much texture in it that it didn't work because I had trained it for quite low resolution and introduced a lot of compression. And then this image had just you know, very fine texture that <laughs> it didn't work on that, which was a strange. So I had to degrade it in order to make it work with the algorithms that I had developed. So that's another, you know, example of you just wouldn't expect a really high quality photo after looking at all of these quite low resolution. And I had totally uh, not considered that uh, data input. And it, it is unrealistic because it was not one of the typical photos, it was from, you know, it was a uh, on request kind of photo. So in that way, it, it didn't transcend the, transgress the ideas of what it should look like. But yeah, you can only see as far as the data. So you have to um, then imagine other scenarios and try to plan in advance for what those could be. That's, that's basically as far as you can go with it. Susan? I think the porn industry has the same problem. Too much resolution kills the game. <laughs> Great. Thank you for two fa fantastic talks. And I would have lots of questions for both of you. Maybe um, just to continue the synthetic data, I, which I find really interesting because, I mean, I'm someone who spent a lot of my career within the sphere of the law. and. Um, the horizon of some sort of legal accountability, I actually think is quite flawed, in fact, and the idea that one would gather evidence for this tribunal that may one day come, I think we have to act much more decisively in the present and not this sort of her legal horizon that we might actually produce some sort of uh, evidential archive for. But that being said, um, Adam, I was curious about, like, I live in the UK where there's only one form of automated image capture that's actually legally admissible, which is the speed cameras that capture images of people speeding in their car. It's the only image that has any legal status uh, that can never be challenged 
uh, doesn't need to be corroborated. So satellite imagery, there's, n there's no agreed upon um, set of uh, legal guidelines such that they could operate as standalone evidence. They always need to be um, correlated. And I guess I'm wondering from your experience, like at least my experience tells me that the judiciary is so hopelessly behind at the level of understanding technological innovation I really wonder how the prospect of synthetic data, um, it certainly would already, AI already radically challenges the legal kind of like understandings. How as a practitioner do you think we can actually start to develop um, protocols or agreed upon kind of like principles such that these kinds of materials actually could um, operate with a certain degree of legal uh, probity because, or is that impossible when everybody, when there's so many artisanal practices happening? I don't know what your experience would lead you to reflect upon in that, in that regard, because I think there's a big gap between what you're doing and then what sort of legal mechanisms then have to actually deal with. Yes, they can bring the expert in, but that expertise then can be challenged on you know so many levels, and once we're actually producing the data synthetically, uh, it seems to open up a really kind of like a Pandora's box from the point of view of of the legal. So I I just curious about your own reflections. Yeah, I agree with you that it that does raise um, concern uh, about the competition for truth between synthetic and real or ground truth. Um, a few a few different things to say uh, in response. One is that the synthetic data right now is always very clearly um, differentiable from a real video or image in its quality, in its histogram, in its artifacts, and in the context, which is entirely lacking. And the, um, you know, you mentioned something about the admissibility of of these images and videos. Um, that is something that's taking a really long time. I've been working on VFrame for it's a little over four, almost five years, and in that time knew nothing about it at the beginning and learned in the first few years that it's really challenging and it sounds almost impossible to realizing that because there are so many people working on this and in terms of collecting it and trying to create a legal case, and at the same time, so many people publishing that there has been progress in the legal departments in order to figure out what makes something legally uh, usable. And I think that the name of the app that I've heard, there may be multiple, is called Eyewitness, and that allows for a direct acquisition of legally usable, but it may, may be different in the UK. It's pretty interesting about speed trap cameras being the only admissible form of an image. Um, Operated or that you can't challenge. Yeah. I, I think um, to allay concerns about the possibility of synthetic data competing too much, there is a really large gap between the quality of these two. Typically, what uh, when it comes out of a 3D program, it's very, it's so uh, 3D rendered and hyper-realistic that it's way too far in that direction. And then you have to really uh, be an artisanal degrader in order to bring it down to, you know, match the target domain. So it requires a lot of work. It's also nothing that Hollywood hasn't already done for a long time. And so the possibilities of doing it in other ways have already existed, especially in Photoshop. So what synthetic data does is just it adds more possibilities to that. But I don't think it raises the condition too far in order to challenge the legal admissibility, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Maybe just to add something to it, um, 
I think technology or practitioners of technology have like a certain tendency to basically like deprive themselves to, to destroy everything that came before and leave it in the dust. I think it's this kind of like Silicon Valley type of understanding of like what technology means for people and for us and what it is that we are building. And I think this is a problem also like, I mean, it's, it has been recited often this like uh, um, move fast, break things. Like um, I know there's a technical definition to this and the process, but actually like uh, it's not just this. Like it also, again, like it has a price that we have to pay for this. I think like, uh, as technologists very often we expect everybody to come on our camp like everybody basically has to learn everything that we do and approach us and then basically be on the same level with us and that's also how we talk to people about it that's how that's what we expect from people and we we as technology because we get I don't know we can charge a lot of money and stuff like this we are too good to actually like uh, change anything about it we feel like really empowered at the moment um, I think in the area where we are working, I think it is very, very important to, to introduce simplicity as like really like as a guiding principle when we build technology. If we can really reduce the complexity of the technological systems, then people can understand them. If we like uh, make them like very, very more complicated than they have to be, then like we will lose people in the process. And uh, I think there's like a there's a disconnect here, and I think it's also like. It's our responsibility as technologists to change this. Like, uh, we have to change the way that we speak to people about uh, technology, about the program that we write, about what it can do. Like that we stop using jargon or just like teach just the jargon that is like absolutely required, and like switch around and take over the language that like uh, that the people use that we work with instead of like that we force them a certain language. I think like if we start doing this and. and it's not going to happen tomorrow, I guess. But like, I think this would also allow for other people who are not like in our domain, who are not experts, uh, to be able to follow up and make a judgment call about it, even though they're not total experts in, in the type of work that we're doing. And adding something uh, short to that, in, in response to an, an earlier question you had about the over-interpretation of results from these systems, I think it is easy and often exploited to lend too much credibility to the output of an AI system. And that's why with computer vision and the example that I showed, it's important to consider both the label and the confidence score together. And that this should constitute the output, not simply, uh, I'm not claiming 100% that it is. It's often 90, 80, you know, bouncing around in this range. And you can see just by moving a hand in front of it changes the score. And so, you know, you have to consider both of those. Something maybe 50% RBK 250 because it was totally smashed, but that means it's still 100% RBK. Whereas you could get something that looks like it and it's a different munition, but it just appeared, you know, and it's actually a higher score. It could be 75%, but it's a false positive. So it's very important to include these two output variables together in the interpretation of the, of the computer vision system. But, but um, maybe you know this, Susan, but like, isn't it like in this Anglo-Saxon kind of like uh, law, the fact that if there is some doubt about like the validity of uh, uh, evidence that it can be dismissed just on, on the basis of a, a small amount of doubt? Yeah, of course, yeah, that's what every prosecutor or uh, defense attorney would try to do was doubt at the level of what, how it was, the image was manufactured or how the claim is made. So this is where one needs to account for all the decisions, et cetera, but also doubt as to the uh, credentials of the expert witness, right? And other cases where they may have found, um, made come to different sort of conclusions. So one's record as an expert witness is also what is under like cross-examination. So I think everything is up for grabs and this is, this is obviously where also um, the funding that one has access to, to rep in terms of the kind of legal representation and the team that would be assisting you would play a kind of crucial role. But yeah, most things that go into courts go as visual aids for, and aids for testimony. They, don't, they may eventually make their way through the legal process and be, become, um, they could be exhibits, but they, you know, they might actually not become evidential. They're often used to help people narrate what happened. So they don't necessarily have to have the kind of classification of evidence. But, um, but sure, everything can be um, the kind of software that was used. Forensic architecture always gets challenged because 
our expertise is collective, and that completely defies the way you can't ask a collective, "Where did you go to school and receive your training?" And you know, and the fact that there are artists and architects as part of the team also has been, you know, consistently um, when a, has been a consistent kind of pushback. At, they don't really have the expertise to be making these kinds of like investigative claims. So yes, of course, I think it's. The, I would say that's the primary, uh, one of the kind of key objectives of legal practitioners is to produce um, doubt, right? Yeah. Last thing, because I find this a very interesting thing and like a few years ago I was like really faced with this dilemma of like how can you collect publicly available data and have it forensically valid, like uh, specifically for court cases and it's like I mean we did some things but it was like like we didn't crack it really, right? Like uh, I mean just a little bit maybe and I think it's a principle, um, I would say a weak point at the moment that we have in the field of data investigation that we until now did not manage or just made very little inroads into this legal system but I think maybe also one of the reasons why that is because like we don't have like legal experts on our team basically I think there could be also something like this like every encounter that I had with um, legal entities it was always more like a type of service provider like we provided a service to them but we were like separated and they just basically told us what they wanted and the way they wanted it and I think this this doesn't work like as soon as you are entering the position of being a service provider, you're losing this insight that you would require to actually transcend uh, this relationship. And I think that would be maybe like a, a very interesting um, uh, step to take to like really like sit together on this. Can I just ask Christo a quick question? It's a bit related. It's because it's around the concept of negative evidence. So we just talked a little bit about doubt, but I find it so fascinating. And I was thinking about a a lawyer friend of mine who worked on the extra rendition flights, and um, the, the redacted documents used a very old system, and so they actually, they actually like measured the amount of black because the, the layout of letters that were used in the documents had specific spacings, and they were able to start to decipher the words be, because of this sort of, in some way it was a less sort of automated form of redaction that and, and the same with those white squares. And I'm wondering, like, I'm uh, guessing that someone would have had to go ma in and manually mask those. So there's, in some way, there's this, what I would call like artisanal or like sort of handmade kind of quality to some of these older forms of negative evidence. And I guess I'm, I'm yeah, it's just, I find it really provocative to think about the ways in, uh, ways in which automation may be closing down this kind of possibility because it's these little handmade intercessions that have actually created the kind of entry points for the investigators. Yeah. I, I don't think there was a big question here, but I think like, um, um, like exploitation is an interesting aspect and like investigators exploit often a situation like a, a, a certain scenario and it just presents themselves and they take advantage of it and that's what they're doing like I think like just uh, going back this exploitation of like we exploited the censorship implementation on biomaps like that was an exploitation of like the way they, they implemented censorship and that allowed it for us to actually start with this research um, I tried to run my program like a few months after that I uh, did the data collection and it was not working anymore. Uh, the thing is like uh, I didn't bother anymore to look at it why it didn't work. It could be a very small thing. I don't think it was like anything on purpose. It's just like the nature of technological development means things change perpetually. And, and, and I think that's just what happened. But it's this like exploitation that's like something that for example like uh, open source intelligence is like really famous for. It's like really clever hacks and tricks to exploit a certain like scenario that uh, presents itself but this is like this is generally interesting but it's only one aspect of data investigation I would say. I was wondering regarding just to close the circle here uh, regarding your first question about the uh, radar cameras uh, that capture uh, a car uh, what's the name uh, Blackas uh, Matricula license plates, exactly. If the legal validity of that uh, outcome doesn't come from the 
technical side, but from the administrative side, in the sense that the only people able to use them are the police. Been, sorry, what I've been told is that there are um, agreed upon understandings of how the technology works and it has to work consistently in every single jurisdiction. But so um, it's those, those agreed upon principles about how, how you translate from, say, uh, the data captured by a satellite sensor, it's not consistent across all the different commercial satellite providers. But so there's a, basically I think what we're talking about in the UK is standardization of technology. So if there was, uh, if every, say, if Wales, England, Scotland were using different systems, no, but I think it's precisely because the technology is completely standardized and they've, there's agreement as to how the translation between the capture of data to, the, to what you ultimately get as an image that those have been completely kind of in some way um, agreed upon. And uh, that's what I've been told by the people who study this, but... Um Makes total sense, but, um, but isn't that defined by the fact that only police in every country can use it? Like it doesn't have any commercial users, doesn't have any alternative users. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just a form of automated image capture. I don't know whether it's exclusive to the police, but... Uh, I mean, I could, I, I don't, and I'm not saying it's globally uh, the same, I'm just saying in the UK, it's the only, it's the only image that has any legal traction, which I, I find kind of, it's, it's a such a domesticated image, and it's the only one that actually can stand up in court, and no one can dispute that image. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, anyway, I don't know more than that, to be perfectly honest, so, yeah. Like I find this idea of standardization at the moment very interesting. It's an interesting word because, like, I mean, I can just tell from my tools. Like, my tools don't work consistent. Like, uh, like, <laughs> like, uh, I don't think I ever aim to do this. And I wonder if, um, at this moment in time, with the uh, field developing as it is, if standardization at the moment is the right call or not. I'm not sure. Like, I really don't know. But like, I found it very interesting uh, thought of like as. Uh, data investigators, do we have to standardize or not in order to make this happen? Is it important enough and is it worth enough that we actually go this uh, process because we would also lose a lot of things. Again, like uh, I don't have an education, I'm not licensed to do anything, right? Uh, so if there would be a standard around it, would I be still able to do this kind of work and would other people like me that follow up or something would be able to get into this field and that's like of course a trade-off and I wonder I find this an interesting thought, like, uh, is that something that we should consider or not? Yeah. Activists aren't necessarily interested in, in, in the legal admissibility of them, but they're interested in, like, public advocacy, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I would agree with you. I think if, 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 if producing something that's legally robust, I think, would really foreclose a lot of activities in relationship to questions of justice and intervention into human rights violations. So I think we definitely can't be thinking just using the framework of, of, of sort of law as our guiding principles because activism would have no place because activism has to deviate, has to repurpose tools and strategies and methods. Can't possibly be um, completely loyal to standardization, I would argue needs to do almost the opposite, yeah. Well, it, what you're saying, it makes total sense. Like, we're not in the game. So, to, to use a corset of legal statutes, I guess, is just not particularly useful. That's what you're saying. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, the law is so, like, arcane, peculiar, has all these rules, procedures that yeah, if, you, if that's the arena that you want to operate in, then you in some way don't have a choice but to... I think, but you talk to lawyers, they want to also push at the limits of the law and change and radicalize the law too, of course. We recognize it's, it's straitjacket, if you will, right? It's, uh, I'm just saying that, uh, that I think... No, I don't agree with standardization, regulation, these regulatory regimes that would re reduce everything because then they would presumably just be subject to governance by large multinational corporations would be, they're already determining 
like I live in, I work in a university where Microsoft runs absolutely everything. You know, it's like, that's a form of standardization in higher education, I would say in the UK, at the level of our software and platform providers, etc. Yep, same here, yeah. <laughs> same here in Spain. Alguna otra pregunta? Are there any other questions? <laughs> Keep it, Susan. <laughs> no, see, sí, no, I have a sí, question. Yes, I, oh, there is dang. a question for the media lab chat. From Alfonso. I can read it right now. <laughs> um, now, okay. From Alfonso FR, other possible application of this text. Uh, here they are using it to detect possible malaria hot spot uh, to Adam. Does it, Paca, does it say malaria hot spots? Hot spot. Hot spots. I don't know. Can, it, can you detect a malaria, you could, malaria hot spot? Maybe if you could model like the mosquitoes uh, and then search for them. It is, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure of the question, um, but can it detect um, like. Um, malaria hot spots? Yeah, from visual images of people documenting bug bites or something? Yes. Well, that's not something that I do, but that is a big topic in computer vision is um, analyzing, you know, um, skin uh, conditions, and Google has recently released a tool. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but if that was the question, the answer is that Google has recently released a tool to do something very similar to that, and it's in beta, and it looks quite impressive, though I wonder where they got all the data. An, an early app um, whose promise, I would say, because I don't believe it was doing uh, actually what it said it was doing, it was to use, um, to use its microphone to detect the background noise of mosquitoes that could, in fact, <laughs> um, uh, have like malaria and, uh, or just the kind of mosquitoes that carry it which would require a kind of mic that uh, I think is not the sort that we have in our phones, or at least I hope it isn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that, that gets into maybe a, I'll, I'll take that question and run with it a little bit because there are, you know, super or subhuman frequencies that can't be um, perceived in audio that can be exploited in ultrasonic, maybe the one with mosquitoes. Uh, that can be picked up by the MEMS microphones on phones, um, but it's something that we can't hear. But the mosquito <laughs> have to be to the phone. Well, I guess you almost always have your phone on you, so... <laughs> yeah, it might have to be quite close or very quiet and not work in an urban area. Um, but, but, you know, running with this question a little bit, um, you can, you can um, think also about the change in resolution that's happened in um, photography. So I'm bringing, bringing the question back into my wheelhouse a little bit here because uh, what is interesting in the example that I brought up before is that you know, when resolution changes enough, it's a different scenario almost entirely. And the models that you train or the technology that you develop for the way that a photo appears in 2013 might be a lot different than 2022. And for, you know, for example, going back to what I showed in the slides is that the very first face detection algorithm called the Car Cascade uh, by Viola and Jones was developed in, I believe, 2003 or 2001. And there were no 4K camera phones at that time. So a lot of the imagery was 640 by 480 CCTV, quite grainy, low quality, slightly blurry. Um, footage and that was used to train. So the encoded um, definition of what a face looked like was quite soft and blurry and it didn't have any texture to it. And that's why the project that I did worked. 
is because you can simply block out or inverse and reverse these like very um, you know, blocky facial features. That's why the makeup attack worked on it, because there was no texture encoded into it. There also was no color information encoded. It was a grayscale image. And that's because the microprocessors at the time just couldn't handle that much information. So what, you know, the big difference is now that deep neural networks do encode color information because you have more processing power. So both the processing power for understanding the image and exploiting differences in it uh, and the resolution of the image are increasing a lot. So you, the smartphones that everyone has in this room are probably at least 10 megapixels. And compare that to the original resolution of a image train used to train the first face detection at 640 by 480, and then think 10 years into the future. Do you have any questions left? Because I have one. <laughs> um, so you've been working uh, closely with um, Catalan artist Joanna Moll, and uh, and also with uh, with um, a, her. Uh, I was going to say business partner, <laughs> her uh, art partner, uh, Vlad and Joller, and um, and they've been working a lot on uh, on themes related to the cloud. Where is it? How much energy it consumes, uh, etc. And while I was seeing your presentation, I was thinking. Um, how easy it would be to use the same protocols to find the clouds all over Europe, because strangely, we don't know where they, where they are. I mean, we would know if we had access to the electricity bills in certain places, of course, but we don't. So another way of like, you know, locating all these spaces uh, would definitely be the way you used to. Because, I mean, while you were, while you were um, showing uh, the defining qualities uh, that help you search, for these installations. I was remembering that some years ago I gave a talk saying that the only infrastructure that is similar to um, the data centers is in fact the detention center. They have the same qualities, the same, even the same kind of protection <laughs> from outsiders uh, and, 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 um, and blocking uh, the insiders <laughs> from coming out, no? And, um, and so I was wondering, did you ever, or have you ever uh, done that research, or would you, maybe? <laughs> um, the easy answer I can give, no, I've never done any kind of research in this area. Um, so the work that, for example, Joanna Mohl does, um, it's super interesting because it looks very strongly at the ecological aspects of technology. And uh, while I'm personally super, super interested in this, and I think it's also really relevant to the type of work that I'm doing, um, I know very little about it, like, uh, to be honest. Um, but I do think that um, when we build technology, we have to consider this as well. Like the, again, like this comes back to this uh, 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 statement about like um, every technology we build also has like a trade-off, and like one trade-off that we always have to consider now, like just also out of an ethical reason, is like the, the environmental impact. Like the way that we build our tools and our, our systems and our platforms and infrastructures, like we have to consider this. Like uh, there is no free lunch anymore uh, regarding this. Like it's over. It's we can't ignore it anymore. Basically, so that's why I think the work that Joanna Mole, uh, Vlad and Yola uh, do is like that's why it's so super interesting and powerful. Like in terms of like, uh, could you find like data centers? So I think there's probably like other ways that would be like easier, like uh, uh, company reports. Uh, uh, um, uh, filings to, to uh, uh, stock exchanges and stuff like this because there is a certain like transparency to data sense because like while they maybe like aesthetically could look similar they are different to detention centers there's a whole different like uh, um, habitus around data centers and that's why like I think there would be other avenues that would be maybe easier and, and more straightforward the question is also like how complete do you want to do this like do you want to find every data center or is it good enough for you to find like I don't know like 90 percent of the data centers or like that's that's like always a question and I think depending on the answer uh, your methodology might change and and that's I think um, uh, um, so I would not, on the spot, I would not know how to approach it. But I think like my first uh, instinct would be to look at data, uh, releases of data that already exist before you try to generate a new data set uh, and see if there's something there or if it's enough. Like, um, yeah. All right, one question. Uh, 
Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, I have a question for you, Christo. Uh, a lot of the data that you've collected, you know, of the Uyghur concentration camps and the, the uh, photographs and the evidence even when it was confirmed, uh, I don't imagine there would be a jurisdiction where you could trial this. So in a way, uh, the output of this is through the media sphere and through influencing perhaps public opinion, I imagine mostly outside of China. Uh, how do you see your, wor your work playing you know, a part of advocacy or transforming the situation that it represents? So there has been actually an attempt uh, to bring the situation in Xinjiang to the ICC. And uh, I think just like half a year ago or something, the ICC turned it down at the moment. They basically said, at the moment, we cannot follow it. But like we are open if there's more evidence down the road that we might open up the case again. So um, the people who were pushing for this uh, uh, court case, we were in contact with them and we shared our data with them. Um, generally, the, the data that we published, uh, public, like that we spoke publicly about, it's accessible and available, and, and you can download it like as a CSV file, just like the raw data, basically. Um, in terms of like, um, how, what was the second part of the question? I apologize. The role of your work. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah. I gave this back too early. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think, um, so, um, like, advocacy is not what I do, and I don't think I would be very good at it either, like, uh, but I think, like, uh, I am interested in, like, other people doing this, like, uh, I always, like, uh, saw my own position as some, I have certain skills and other people can use them to good effect, I think, but, like, I always need, like, also, like, a driver, like, uh, uh, as I said, like, so, I think advocacy is super interesting, but, of course, like, I am interested in human rights, and human rights is also a legal concept, and while, I'm, I'm not a super fan of like this blind thinking in law terms. I think it, uh, it lacks a lot of uh, 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 things. Like in terms of human rights, there are some very interesting uh, aspects to it. And I, would, I personally would like to see like a, a, that the legal system or the human rights courts could use data more than they do now. Like, so there are some attempts and there have been some precedents based on social media. But um, uh, this was mostly social media where people uh, uh, generated evidence by themselves about themselves. So somebody posted a picture of themselves in front of a dead body or something like this and claimed uh, the, the act. So that was a very different case, of course. I think that the, there is more there and I think like um, for human rights on a bigger scale, I think there would be a lot in there if there could be like more connections. But I personally, I don't have these connections yet. Uh, I think one problem, of course, is that open source or not open source, publicly available data has just some legal issues. Like if you bring this to a court, it's very hard to prove that like where you got this from, who had it, like you, you have no chain of custody for data, like, uh, and this makes like everything like much, much harder. So I think there's also something to be said about like that courts have to basically tell us like maybe a possibility of like how we can make it possible. And I think there has been an attempt recently, I think Bellingcat uh, was it, that, that made like, um, a, a, like a mock trial in order to like see to test a, a court or like a court situation to see how far they can get and I think the, the results were a little bit mixed uh, but I think like um, um, it would be interesting to see if you can push it further and what would be required but I'm also not convinced that this would be the only avenue I think the field is broad and it's it's generally applicable and not everything needs like a, a legal recourse and I think there's a lot of space where you can like use data um, with different qualities or attributes and still basically have them like uh, fit for purpose. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, just a quick follow-up, sorry. Um, I mean, I think we're in a moment when we're seeing something quite interesting is that basically every state is scrambling to see, you know, what role does it take, you know, in international uh, courts and, you know, what does it even mean? So, for instance, when we saw in Ukraine that, uh, you know, the Russian army was using thermobaric weapons, uh, this, w this was, you know, originally, you know, kept in secret, but then or they wound up admitting that they were using it. And, you know, they're not signatories, you know, of the treaties that prohibit this. Um, so how does it work in terms of, you know, truth-setting? That's 
I think we're in a strange moment when I think a lot of taboos about, um, and, and that may be more directed towards your practice, actually, but where a lot of taboos about weapons that are forbidden by the laws of war, for instance, are being, you know, melted, like right in front of our eyes. So, I mean, where do we go from this? Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of tension between the capabilities of what technology can do, the reality of what's true and not, and then the actual legal process and how slow and challenging that can be, and that the ICC is maybe not the right place for all of these, and many of them will not go anywhere, and there will be no justice for a lot of people. I think it's easy, yeah, unfortunately, um, but this shouldn't prevent any of the projects from moving forward. I think it's quite easy to get discouraged with this work, especially if you spend years working on something, looking at terrible footage and probably undergoing some psychological trauma, and you don't even know if anything is going to happen. Yet there are a lot of people doing this, and just with the hope that it could, that it might be possible, makes it still worth it. And I think that people working in um, the legal areas, they want to catch up, um, and there are a lot of questions that need to be answered, and they can't be answered that quickly. So in the meantime, um, developing these tools, but do, you know, trying to do so in the most responsible way and um, getting feedback, doing trials, not racing them out the door, and uh, working, you know, I'm not unhinged uh, technologist in my project, I'm working, grounding myself with the advice of both uh, experts who understand the objects and the human rights re researchers and trying to understand this legal process that's come up a lot tonight in order to guide what it is that I do. So I went through years of prototyping in order to figure out what kind of tool would help the process, and the process that the researchers are doing is guided by, that's a top-down kind of causality from ICC. Once you understand that, you can like reverse engineer this algorithm from a technologist standpoint into what types of data, what types of algorithms can then push it back in the other direction, up, upwards. I, I'm not sure how we are on time. Very quick. Very quick. Very quick. My answers are very here. quick always. Um, like when we always talked about like uh, uh, court law and justice, we always actually like implied that it's punitive justice. And I think that's maybe also something to consider that um, while I do think it's interesting to like understand this area better, I think there's like different form of justices um, that exist as well. And I think like maybe uh, it would be a chance to focus more on those uh, things. Like when, when I was working in the Syrian archive, like I was always looking at this data and I thought like, well, I mean, what's going to happen with this, right? And I always thought like, well, the really huge value of this archive is actually for the generations to follow. And like when these generations have to like uh, uh, work through like what happened, what happened in Syria and like if like, any form of like justice or, or justice or reconciliation has to happen. Like uh, then, these uh, data collections, these uh, processes that we establish now are going to be extremely valuable. Because of course, like before you can like uh, put something to rest or like come to terms with something, you also have to be able to name it. And if we can't name it, that's a problem. And I think that's something that we also saw in Europe, like after the Second World War, like the inability to name things was really like an issue. And I think like of course, data allows us to basically like. Uh, to find uh, the, the, the visual imagery in order to name something. And I think uh, part of this work, when we talk about justice, I think we should like, really focus maybe also as practi practitioners on the, on the area of transitional justice. Uh, I think there would be more there where we can have like, a higher impact than maybe punitive justice systems. All right. Well, all your other questions in the bar, please. <laughs> Gracias por haber venido. Thank you for coming and for holding us with, uh, holding up with us. Thank you so. Coming to Madrid, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Hopefully, the first of many visits. And um, gracias a todos. Thanks, everyone.